This week's episode is sponsored by Ryan at Change. If you are looking to get involved in e-commerce and build a successful online business, then check out my good friend Ryan, who I have been working with the last few years and attended many events and retreats all around the world, spending time with members who are making some serious money. I have been promoting Ryan for a while now because I believe in what he does and not only has he helped and supported me build my own businesses, but I have seen firsthand how he helps and supports his members take their businesses to new levels and give them financial freedom. So if you are interested in getting into e-commerce and building successful online stores, then message Ryan on his Instagram at RyanJB to join his winning team. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got John Alight. How are you, John? I'm good, thank you. Ah, uh, listen, it's good to have you on. Yeah. Um, mad story, known hitman, done a lot of damage back in the day. You've yeah. kind of, I wouldn't say wisened up, but you've kind of tried to speak out against that life because it is a fucked up life. Um, I was, it was always glorifying to me. It was always a nice, always seemed, when watching the movies and stuff, that life was amazing. And then you start to interview these people and you start to actually feel sorry for them because it's a life of misery, a life of pain, and you know this prime example. You were in the middle of it, but first and foremost, how are you? I'm good, and you know, you know what the problem with the light. And by the way, I love you guys' accents. You know the way you guys talk, so it's so different from, from us. But you know, I'm you know I go over to the UK a lot, so I travel around that area a lot. But you know what the problem is? It's easy to get away from the life, but it's hard to get away from the from the dumb fucking people in the life, you know? So, you know, where they constantly trying to challenge you, you know, and you're trying to have a different life because you know the end up. The end up is if you resort to what you used to do, you, your life's going to be finished. You look great anyway. You're looking well. Thank you. Before we get into everything, no, I always like to go back to the start, John. Get a bit of understanding about you, where right. you grew up, how it all began. Yeah. Uh, you know, I grew up as a young kid around gambling joints my father was uh partners with a guy called uh blackie uh luciano charlie lucky luciano's first cousin also a made guy in the gambino family my father grew up with him and my uncle ran a three-card game of monte in the in the bronx so i was around these guys since i'm a baby and uh as you're getting older you're looking up to them you're seeing them dress nice making money you hear stories while you're sitting around as a young kid you know, tough guy stories, and you know, you start getting drawn to it. Was that an attraction for you straight away? But it became the norm. Yeah, it was an attraction because my father wasn't a money guy. He was just a, a boxer. He was in the ring. He was in he was in the navy fighting. So he liked that tough guy stuff. But he wasn't a gangster himself. Just friends with him all, and in business with him, he owned a couple of bars as a kid, up and down with money because he was a gambler and. Uh, you know, so I was always had street guys around us. What was it like being an Albanian kid in America? Was there any sort of teasing or bullying because you were different? Yeah, you know, the the problem is in, uh, you know, growing up, there wasn't that many Albanians. Albania was shut down. It was a communist country. So we were always a, a country that was poor and suppressed, that my family was poor. And, you know, when you come and you're an Albanian in this country, in the Italian world, you get a lot of these guys if you you know you're in this business that they talk nonsense because if you talk about the Cray brothers, not they're not Italian. Brian is a friend of mine, a tax man. He's not Italian. So you know guys from the UK, they're tough. They're tough guys, real tough guys. And then you got these dummies here. Say, oh, they ain't Italian. What's that got to do with being a gangster? 
You know, they just talk out of school because they ain't they're not street guys or they wouldn't talk like that. How were you at school, John? Did you go to school? Yeah, much? yeah, I, w I went to school, but I was a baseball player. I had a full ride scholarship in baseball. I was a captain of my high school team, but I didn't really bother with the studies. You know, I I, yeah. I should have, but I didn't. Is that how you ended up good with a bat later on in life? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I started with the bat <laughs> <laughs> and finished with it. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> Is uh, so? What did you do in school? Did you see your father being active and around all these kind of high-profile men? Yeah, my father brought me around a lot of big-time gangsters because he was in a track. Also, he was a gambler. So he would be at the horse track, and that's where all the gangsters were. Especially back then, as a little kid, he'd bring me and introduce me to all kinds of guys. He was always bringing me to your card games and. And, and things like that. So he started getting me to hustle with him in card games, you know, and uh, he, just, he the attraction was there. He didn't mean it, but that's what he did. Yeah, that's all he knew. Yeah. But so he wouldn't mind if you were hustling and doing your stuff. Would, would he be happy if you turned out to be like him? Yeah, he wanted me to be that way, but he didn't want me in the drug business and I ended up going in the drug business. He thought I could scale like he did, you know, just go on the street, be rough with your hands, go to the gym's box, gamble book make shylock money but that's it he didn't want me going out becoming a a shooter and you know using bats and and stabbing guys and you know i went into a different direction than he did because your friends were shooting at 12 and 13 is that correct yeah i was i was very uh like i was more of a shy guy and i wasn't violent as a kid all my friends were yeah they were getting locked up they were all in juvenile uh jails and i wasn't when did that violence start appealing to you i think uh at around 14 i started changing a little bit and then by a little after that uh i was in uh, i used to work at uh, jamaica avenue at a deli that was all gangsters and mobsters hanging around there and uh gang street gang friend of mine they were all in a gang called seven and nine and the guys were getting hurt on a regular basis they were coming through the neighborhood they were getting stabbed up or killed and and then I started looking at uh, changing my life in that direction with them because I seen the money and I, I seen the guys moving around and, uh, and it just, you're hanging around with those type of guys, you start becoming those type of guys. What was it like doing your first bit of violence? Were you scared? Yeah, you know, when the, the first time you get in, uh, you know, I was collecting money and then uh, for a bookmaker was with another family and I was very close to him. He was across the street from us and his niece was my girlfriend. His brother was also a made guy. And they asked me to collect money from uh, And eventually he asked me to hurt a guy. And my adrenaline was running. The guy answered the door and I was nervous. I wanted to do it. I didn't want to do it. I wanted to show I could do it. And your heart's beating like crazy. And the, you know, the, the thing, as soon as you open the door, I just started swinging. And more so because of my own fear of, I didn't want to chicken out. I wanted to be, so if I knew if I started talking at all, I wouldn't do it. And as soon as he opened the door, I just hit him with that bat. It's for human beings, <clears throat> it's not a normal thing to do, is harm other people, in my own opinion, but it's the fear of being embarrassed, being called a chicken, being called a shite bag, where it makes you want to do it because you care too much of what other people think. Did you see that? Yeah, I mean, listen, one of the, it's funny you said it, because one of the biggest things, as we were kids, because... Since we were kids, my father always had us in the ring, boxing downstairs. It wasn't the fear of getting beaten up. It was the fear of losing. You didn't care about fighting, but you didn't want to lose. You don't want to be embarrassed. And the people saying, oh, you got your ass kicked by so-and-so. Because I remember, I remember, you know, I'm good with names. So there was a, a kid, he was kind of a friend of mine, Ronald Mankey. And we were playing dodgeball. We hit a guy, and I hit him in the face with the ball. He wasn't playing. He was looking. And then he said something to me. I went after him. And as soon as I stepped up to him, I didn't expect him. He punched me in the face. <laughs> and after he punched me in the face, he, he was a tall, skinned, thin kid, strong. He started to run. But the next day in school, everybody said, look at Ronald and John, bro. You, you, uh, give him a black eye. And my eye was puffed up. And I was more jealous, uh, jealous, more angry and, and, and mad that he did that. And uh, I wanted to get even with him. Now I want to fight him every day. But it actually was kind of a friend of mine. Yeah, the pride gets dented. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy, that. It's, it's crazy, as men, crazy. how much destruction it's caused all around the world just by pride. Yeah, Just yeah. because how you feel internally. It's yeah. fucking crazy. 
So see, when you started, when did you start making a reputation for yourself? What age? Uh, as a young kid, they would all say I was fearless. You know, I got to another fight with a really big guy and uh, I was boxing him and he was beating me. I'm young. And the guy's name was Alfred, right? And, and I got this bright idea to wrestle him and throw him on the floor when I was boxing. And he landed on top of me and he starts giving me a beating. And my friends, I, most of my friends were there. They were trying to break it up and I wouldn't let them break it up. And, you know, he's crying, the guy. The guy was a nice guy. He was just a big guy. And he's crying and he's pummeling me. And, you know, I'm bleeding and he's, you know, bloody in my lip, my nose. And he's crying, please stop. He's asking me to please stop. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm, I'm going to get up. But I couldn't get up. He was just too big. And he's got his legs on my arms. And, you know, at that time, I didn't know how to fight, especially with wrestling. You know, I know how to use my hands only, not wrestling. I didn't grapple yet. Later on, I learned to grapple. But, uh, you know, that that gives me the, you know, it started giving me a reputation that this kid's nuts, this kid's wild, this kid's, you know, he's fearless. And even though I'm getting a beating, I, I kind of got up the better of him because he doesn't want to hurt me. Mm -hmm. How many was in your crew? Well, I had a ton of guys. I had probably in total about 100 guys after my main guys and my main guys all got crews with them, so. When did you become friends with Gotti Jr.? I met him in about when he was about uh, 16, I guess, something like that. 16, I, I did 15 or 16 he was. I was a year old. He was in military school. Is that when your life then went right into the mix of it? Uh, you know, sort of around, you know, around that time I was already getting violent. I was already in a drug business, but not, not in a big way. And then... In the next year or two, yeah, I start really getting violent. Is that a regret in your life? Yeah, of course I regret it. You know, the, the problem is you can't take it back. And the problem is all these big mouths. You want to go back and it's your ego and you want to slaughter some of them that would talk like that. But, you know, at the same time, you want to go in a different direction. So it's, it's pretty frustrating, but you deal with it. See if you're making a name for yourself in New York, being dangerous, being fearless, does the other families then get wind of it and want you to join like their crew or how does it work? Yeah, I mean, you know, I started off really with a lot of guys from Jersey because that's where my father was. He grew up in the Lower East Side, but his partner Blackie was from uh, North Jersey, they call the Lodi area. And then the Lucchese family, the guys I really started staying with as a kid when I was collecting and bookmaking because that was my little girlfriend's uncle and, and father. But then later on after that, I start running around with the Gambino family because my baseball coach is Albert Ruggiano, whose father is the neighborhood boss at that time. How big were the Gambino family back then in yeah. the 80s? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were that they big? Early. Oh, they were big. The, the Gambino family was, uh, you know, it depends on the years it changes. But at one time, it was the Lucchese family. Then it switched over, became the Genovese family, became the major family. In New York, uh, the violence uh, during the wars with the Colombo family, the the Gambino family later on gets strong. So it's an up and down between all. But it's not like people think. Most of these families, we all work together. Uh, you know, until there's an issue. If somebody kills somebody without getting permission, and then, then the hitting starts, or the money grabs. Guys get greedy, and they get killed, and then some of the, the shooting starts. Yeah, how many people are in each family, John? Does it vary? I mean, you got about, yeah, it varies. You, you got, a, on an average, about 200 made guys in each family. You know, a little more, a little less. Uh, and then you got the associates that are around all these guys, depending what, how big some guys' crews are. So you were known as a hitman, but there's not a lot of, there's, a, there's not a lot of trigger men in. No, nah, there's not. See, I always thought everybody had a gun, everybody was a trigger man, everybody was ready to kill. So did I, <laughs> you know, so did, you're not saying something that as a kid, I think everybody's doing what I'm doing. You know, that, that's the, the, the misconception of the mob. Everybody thinks there's a bunch of guys doing this, but I run through names all the time and tell, you know, people ask me different. I like Pete Gotti, but he never shot a gun. Another guy, Jack, he knows these guys have become bosses. They never shot a gun. They never did no armed robberies. They didn't do anything. You know, so it, everybody fits a position depending on what you need them for. And most of the guys are like sheep. So the guys that are violent, everybody steps aside. And I used because of the UK and you're on that from that end, from Scotland and, and different things. You can name these street guys, like the Cray brothers have a big reputation or, or uh, Marvin Herbert, right? 
a black guy. He's a good friend of mine. He talks to me a lot. Uh, Patrick Jenkins from, you know, from, from over there was in prisons with me. Guys, uh, Justin uh, Beck, these guys were in prison with me in Brazil. So, you know, these some of these guys got reputations. Uh, Lou, another guy, he was originally uh, not from the country, I think he was from Africa, and he was in prison with me in Brazil. And these guys get, all these guys got a reputation of uh, being dangerous when they want. Some of them a little more than the others are very dangerous guys. So when people are talking at a school, they, they just really don't get that there's only a certain mentality and nobody's going to really tell them what to do. And if they do, you're going to have to kill them to stop them. I think America, though, it's more organized with the mafia. It's, it used to be all underground, but everybody now is out talking and telling and it's crazy. But with the UK, it's, <clears throat> it's not as organized. There's organized crime, of course, but it's not as, as ruthless as it was here is with the five families everything organized thousands of men ready to go the uk is a couple of family few brothers few uncles it may be run the streets run the drug trade but it's not as organized i think the uk is a free-for-all it's kind of it's embarrassing i think in the uk yeah well you know what the, the the problem is like i said if you have a good five to ten guys that are shooters guys that are you know the all the, the violent guys with a half a brain not just the shooter you could take over this stuff because they don't have these kind of shooters like everybody thinks. You know, they just don't, it, it doesn't exist. There's a very small percentage of guys that go out and really do this kind of work. The rest of them are just moving around, hustling, making money, white collar crimes, little schemes here and there, dealing drugs. But they're not gangsters out there shooting. You could go through a list if you, if you did a little research and see, you know, a guy shoots one guy, maybe another guy shoots one or two guys. But they're not out there really putting in work, you know, day and night. Yeah. See the five families. See if you've got, if someone outside of the five families has a team of five, ten, they're making a bit of money, they're dangerous, and they didn't go and work for another family, does their life become in danger? I mean, listen, if you've got five or ten guys that are, are very capable, you'll get guys, off, offshoot of guys, like we had the Irish gang, the Westies. So they would contract, the families would contract work to them and they'd be doing killing for the family. This episode is sponsored by Fire Away Pizza, the fastest growing pizza company in the UK with over 150 stores. With their fresh quality ingredients and unique pizzas, they will have you coming back for more. Use code JAMES20 for 20% off. That's James 20 for 20% off. Uh, uh, when they get a little out of hand, yeah, if you can lure them in. The problem is guys, uh, you know, they all betray each other, especially for money. You know, it's easy to, you know, and they manipulate guys with betrayal. They don't have, it's not what everybody thinks that these guys are so loyal to each other. You know, and I always use myself as a prime example because when I went to prison in Brazil, I'm sitting in a penitentiary, I went on the run everybody's the way you, you guys use the word grass. Everybody's grassing on me. 60 guys are grassing on me. I'm sitting in a penitentiary and the whole organization's giving me up. So it's not what people think. A guy like me never got caught. So how, what am I doing in front of the justice system unless everybody's grassing on me because they never got caught. How much was it for a contract killing in the 80s? Uh, it, if you, you know, these days they're not really killing anymore. Though, that's over. You know, I don't, I don't even think they had two killings in the last five years. But the, uh, prior to that, depending on who you're going to hit, uh, if they're going to, if somebody's offering you money to hit them, or if somebody's, you know, in 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 our world, like when Gotti was the boss, the father, uh, he'll tell you go do a piece of work, and if you're going to go do that piece of work, it's not where he says I'll give you a hundred thousand. But what they do do is put you into action. You know, like me, they put me in a bookmaking business and started giving me big players. So you make your big money. Maybe they'll give you another guy who has a Shylock book. And like here with Sammy Gravano ratted, he had a half a million dollars on, on the street. And a big Louie took his book. Sammy didn't do anything. He's hiding somewhere. So, you know, there's your reward. You get, you, you take over somebody's book with a half a million on it. So you're making all kinds of money. It's Shylock money, excuse me. Well, not his book, a Shylock book. So, that's the, the, the things you get off at things and you start moving around and you're getting different uh, your offers, especially when you're, you're, you're violent, whether it was guys like Roy DeMeo, I just did a, a show on him on my podcast. 
These guys are making money like crazy before in the car business. So, you know, basically they're running that 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 industry. Who was your boss before Gotti? Before Gotti, I had uh, different people. Fat Andy before that, Louie uh, uh, Gaddy uh, was one of the guys that I asked. Uh, uh, another guy uh, before Louie, uh, his brother. So depending on the years and what year when you're growing up and when you're coming around, uh, who you're answering to. So Gotti became boss. Did, was it him? At, was it Castello? Get murdered? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it was. Uh, and Castello was a boss. Castellano. Castellano was so. Castellano Got, was a boss of the Gambino family. And was it Gotti that killed him or got him yeah, killed? Yeah, Gotti made the order to, to, to get him to kill him. Yeah. So Castellano, did he not have a big family? Why was there no retaliation? Uh, a lot of reasons. Gotti was smart. What he did was he started taking, uh, aligning himself with the younger generation of gangsters. The older guys at Castellano were around were a little older. Uh, he had his driver, Tommy Bellotti, who was a younger guy, but Tommy didn't have that many guys anymore. And Tommy was the next guy that's supposed to go into position. So not only is Gotti smart enough to kill Castellano, he knows he's got to kill Bellotti because Bellotti will be the next guy in line for the boss position. So he understood that and he took the younger guys like Frankie DeChico who had a big following in Brooklyn. He took uh, Frankie Locasio in the Bronx who had a big following. So he took the younger guys that the older guys couldn't challenge him. And you know, at the time when he set it up, he, he had a big crew, John had a big crew himself. You know, he had his brother, he had his, uh, the Kinnig, uh, Johnny Kinnig, he had get different guys, Tony Roach, uh, he had, uh, you know, Willie Boy Johnson before he, they found out he was an informant, he gets killed. But he had shooters, Angelo Ruggiero. So that was Gotti's boss? Was uh, Castellano at the time, yeah. So there was, was there a friendship by those two? No, no, he didn't like him at all. He didn't respect him. Castellano yeah. was a businessman that made billions of dollars for himself and for the family. Billions, actually, not millions. And, uh, you know, Gotti had an outlook of him as a businessman, but that's not completely accurate either. Actually, under Castellano's rule, he, he hit more guys than, than under John's rules. So Castellano did have a lot, of, a lot of guys he hit, and he had one of the most dangerous crews around. He had the uh, Roy DeMeo and uh, Nino Gaggi and the, and the Testa brothers and Santa. Uh, so, you know, Anthony Santa. So these guys were the biggest hitters probably in a mob in, in the last hundred years prior to the, young, the other generation of Albert Anastasia and Murder Rank. I don't think there's anybody that killed more than these guys. So if you're a boss and you've got someone like John Gotti, who's moving through the ranks, making money, building an army. How does a boss handle that? Surely they've got wind of he's becoming dangerous, he's you could potentially becoming a target. Because made men, they're not supposed to get killed, the bosses are not supposed to get killed. Did he feel that that would never have happened anyway, or was there always suspicion that? Yeah, you know, all the bosses get killed over the years, Galante gets killed, you know. You know, the, the rules are there only to break. I talk about this all the time. They got rules, but nobody stands by them. And, you know, Paul knew he was in trouble with John. He knew he was he was getting a reputation. He knew that John wanted the position. But Paul had two cases going at the time. He had the commission case. That was a big case that everybody went to prison about. And then the, all the bosses. And he also had uh, a case with Roy DeMeo. And here's Paul's uh, uh, problem. He ends up killing Roy DeMeo. That's his hit squad. So it weakens him tremendously within the family by hitting him. But he also wanted to hit him because he had too many bodies and he had a case, Roy. So at the time when John decides to hit Paul, Paul's hands were tied because he had two major cases going. He was probably going to jail for life. He was fighting. He didn't need, he didn't need any more notoriety around him. If he would have killed John or somebody, then... That would have been another, you know, case a little more uh, pressure on Paul at that, at that time. But John used that as a fact to say, let's kill Paul because he's going to kill us. John was smart. And he maneuvered the rest of these guys because he had the, uh, he wanted to take the uh, leadership role and take over the family. So John was smart. He manipulated. He killed Paul. And there was a little, obviously, it's trouble not within our family, but the other families for not getting a, a permission and a commission to kill Paul. So that's when they start clipping, they're hitting guys in our family one at a time. So when Gotti becomes boss, because the, the, the mafia were under the underground, they should be secretive and everything's just kept in house. But 
was it Gotti who changed all that and glamorized being a gangster or was it already done beforehand you know, you, you had different guys. You had Al Capone that glamorized it. You, there was other guys that glamorized it. And I know you hear the media because, uh, you know, John was the last one to, to bring it out, you know, in, in the public eye the way he did. But there's there's been a lot of guys that brought out in the public eye. There's guys that, you know, that wrote books like Columbo. And, you know, you got guys now doing podcasts all over the place. You know, I kind of started that here in, in, this, in, the, in the States. And then you got a, a lot of guys that follow. Now they're all doing podcasts. So, you know, listen, it's just, but I'm not active. The difference is I'm, I'm finished. I'm retired. These guys that are uh, doing podcasts that, that are active or whatever the situation is, guys don't like it. You know, they, they call guys rats and this and that. But, you know, I have my own understanding of that. And I, I already told guys, every rule that I could go through with you, they have broken. Every boss and every crime family in the United States, for the most part, is ratted. Not every single one, but a good majority of them ratted. War wires and different things. So this organization from Albert Anastasia, and I talked about him, he, he was a rat. You know, he murder rank, he actually brought in his best friend, one of his best friends for murder rank. So when he, when he brings in Lepke, he gives him up, he hands him right over the FBI, he's a rat. Lucky Luciano at 16 got caught with the heroin business. And he said, I was just a kid at the time when he, when he, when he grasped. So, you know, it's not what people, it's about survival. And in, in, in my opinion, the only way it stays loyal is if you keep a small group of your childhood friends. And even then guys break weak on you, but they'll have loyalty to you. And you get five, 10 guys, you can get away with it. When you get in mass numbers like this, they all start rolling too hard to control it's too hard to control it's, it's what happened with me you know again i'll say it what happened to me i'm in brazil penitentiary i'm not talking i went on a run i left my family i spent millions of dollars and uh everybody's ratting on me they're all grassing so you know it's it, when guys talk about the loyalty i could show you each boss like i i tell everybody guys like joe messina war wire in on the banano family you got sammy gravano in the, in the gambino family He's ratting. You have guys in the Lucchese family, like Diaco, that was one of the bosses he ratted. And then later on, you had Gaspipe, one of the biggest killers around, he ratted. You know, I go over to Philadelphia, Ralph Natale and Leonetti, they ratted. Yeah, you know, so, you know, I could go on with this list. Chicago, you had the, the, uh, the um, Chicago in uh, Pittsburgh, you had Chucky Porter, he ratted, another boss. In, in Boston, you had the Irish mob, you had the uh, uh, Mighty Bulger, he ratted. Uh, it, it's not what people think that, you know, they're, they're only, these guys are all moving around and then you know, how many informants are within all these organizations and there's jealousy and it's about money also. And it's about fear. If they, they think I'm going to kill them, of course, they're going to start get, dropping dimes and, and, and talking to the police and tell them this guy's killing guys. He's shooting guys. You know, this is the real world of a mob, not the bullshit. Everybody watches at movies, all these, typewriter guys that are gangster and on a typewriter or, you know, you know, pushing buttons, you know, they'll talk about whoever, whether it was the Cray brothers, whether it's me, whether it's any other guy, but if you sat them in this hotel room with us, you know, they're going to sit there with their hands folded and they're going to be quiet because they realize, okay, if I open my mouth, you know, I'm going to go out that window. Yeah. So Stephen got it became boss and you're friends with his son. Did you sense, did you feel another bit of power coming your way because you had then more room to play with or was it just the same nah you know my mistake was i should have never got involved with them you know yeah you, you, i grew up around it i got involved with them i had my own crew i made my own money i did my own shooting and work i didn't need nobody it was a big mistake i was just young and like those guys i was impressed and i and exactly what you said earlier i thought everybody was doing the shooting you know, I, I didn't know, you know, was, you, you're young and you, you, you know, people don't go out. In our day, there was guys getting killed left and right. You know, I'm getting shot up. I'm getting stabbed up. I'm, you know, just all my friends, same thing. Most of us got shot, stabbed. Everybody's getting killed. So we don't know who, unless they're your immediate friends, you don't know who's pulling the trigger. So if you carry yourself well, you, you, you're not sure if this guy's a killer or not. In these days, nobody's killing. So, you know, none of them are killers. You know, it's not like an odd day where everybody's dropping bodies every day. I mean, every day there was a, a, there was a murder. Yeah. What was it like shooting someone for the first time, John? 
You know, again, it's an adrenaline rush. You want to do it because you believe in that life. And if you think somebody crossed you and, you know, some of these shootings I do are guys that are trying to kill me, guys are talking about killing me. Worse than trying to kill me is talking about it. And you get a lot of guys that just talk so, you know, bullshit because they're impressing somebody. And once you hear about it, you're going to go shoot them. And if they, you know, if somebody's fucking with our money or our drug business, you're going to go shoot them. There is no warnings. There's no talking. You know, you do a lot of talking now because you're not killing nobody. But when you're in that life, you, you, you're not talking. Because you've admitted killing, you, you were a known hat man. What was it like killing someone for the first time? Really nothing. I mean, it's adrenaline to shoot them, but you, you, know, you, you really don't care. I've talked about this. You know, when I was in court, the prosecutor's asking me questions about what I ate. And this is how detached you are, like I was, or most of us, I guess, is I'm like thinking to myself, what the fuck does he care what I ate? You know, I'm, I'm actually laughing. I'm saying, what's this guy nuts? What does he care what I ate? But he's trying to show that right after I killed somebody, I'm out eating. I remember what I ate, where I went to eat, at bringing guys, I'm laughing, I'm joking. And, you know, so he's trying to show, look, these guys are, you know, are just fucking nuts. You know, we like we just aren't in reality of, of real life. Like we take a life and no big deal. We go eat a chocolate pie after that, have a soda, have a, have a burger, and obviously it didn't affect us. You're not like in a corner somewhere throwing yeah. up. That's I'm what laughing because it's fucking nuts. But do you then look at it and think how psychotic you all wear. It's like a fucking mental institute. It's like everybody's, because they're so ingrained in that life, like you say, you're putting a bullet in someone's head and then going eating a chocolate pie. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I went, my friends are at a pool hall on 111th Street in Atlantic and uh, Liberty Avenue. It's, a, it's an ozone park where we grew up. And I get a call from Frankie Burke. He, he's Jimmy Burke's son, the one from Goodfellas. He's a real good friend of mine. And he says to me, are you, you know, I'm in my Corvette because we didn't have phones. I had the phone in a Corvette. You know, we used to put the phones in there. Anybody that was making money in drug business, we had phones. So I go, he goes, I'm not around, but Joey Danker and Angelo Castelli, they got a problem that pool hall, shoot there. So I call him, I'm calling the bar now, right? I'm trying to get them, I don't get them on the phone. I get there and I have a problem with two guys. And anyway, I end up putting a pool stick over the guy's head in the middle of whatever's going on between them. And uh, the guy's big guy, same thing. He comes after me and he lands on top of me and we're rolling around and Angel will start shooting him. So I'm screaming, Angelo, you're gonna shoot me too. You know, cause you're shooting, we're all tangled up now. We're wrestling, we're tangled up and he's blasting away at the guy. And I think he had, and he had a big gun, maybe a 357, he had something big. He had a cannon on him. And then the, the other guy's fighting Joey Danko, who's one of the brother-in-laws of Vinny Gotti. And then he, Angelo shoots him. He's trying to run out the other guy. He shoots him in the back. Now we take off. We go to a diner again to eat. I walk in a diner in Brooklyn in Canarsie. This happened in Queens. We go to Canarsie, Brooklyn. And the waitress knows me and she says, John. I said, what? She goes, your whole back is full of blood. So I was soaked with blood, my back. So now I'm like, this guy shoot me somewhere, you know, without, cause you're adrenaline. So we go in the bathroom and they bring me one of the bus boys clothes. I put it on and I'm like, how the fuck is, do I got blood all over me like that? Because it's behind me, it's not in front. So I don't know how that blood got all over me. Cause, and then I said to Angela, well, you out of your fucking mind? You could have killed me, man, what's wrong with you? Oh, I knew what I was doing. Meanwhile, he's snorting coke, he's drinking, he didn't know, <laughs> and everybody. So, you know, most likely both these guys died. You know, I don't know if they did or didn't, but most likely you're getting hit with a cannon. And, uh, you know, but this is every day for us. We're going to eat. Then, you know, it's just one shooting after another. We're all, and we're tight with each other. We're all moving drugs within each other. You know, we all hang out at the same place, PM Pub and Ozone Park, and guys are getting, massacred there on a, if you're from outside the neighborhood you're stupid enough to come there there's got to be something wrong with you if you know we're all there because just too many killers at that time staying at the same bar is your dad still alive at that time yeah my dad's still alive he's in a nursing home i go see him i i <clears throat> fool around him and i put some tapes up me but fool around with my hands with him because he's not all there but with, he still moves mm -hmm. and you know he's in a wheelchair and he'll move around and i'll fool around i'll, I'll slap him and he'll try to kick me and you know it's funny, so I just, I try to keep him alive, like play with him. What was he saying when he realized you became a killer? Did he uh, know? Oh, yeah, he, listen, even as I got old, my father always hit me. 
you know, he would hit you, be great and belittle you. You know, he just, he tried everything. I mean, on my father's behalf, because there's a book that I did, uh, Darkest Hour, when I was growing up, and people see my father as being like an animal. And I'm like, it's not true. My father loved me. He just didn't want me to get bullied on the street. He grew up in Lower East Side with Vito Genovese and guys like that. So he just wanted you to be tough to handle yourself. He didn't know he was going to develop me into a monster because basically that's what he developed me into without realizing, you know. And, you know, he didn't want me doing this shit. He didn't want me selling drugs. He was, the first time he found out, he was steaming. He was mad at me, disappointed. We'd argue, he'd throw me out. He sent me to California to go by one of my uncle's house. I got locked up there three or four times. They brought me back. They kicked me out of the state. And uh, he tried, man. He did what he, what he thought was best for me as a, as a father, you know. I don't blame him for nothing. It was me. I was nuts. It was my friends. Because you sold drugs as well. That's been known. I thought that was, like, not allowed in the mafia. Is yes. that another bullshit? Another bullshit rule. Everybody's selling drugs. <laughs> too much money. It's too much money. Those movies ought to get fucking banned then because they're all fucking fake. Yeah, that's what he said. I can give you all the rules of the mob. Everything's bullshit. That, you know, these you only, you only can impress dumb kids with it. And, you know, when we're young, we're dumb. As we get older, we understand life. You know, this, like you know, like, like I said, there is no nationality that makes you a gangster. The gangster, and whoever's a gangster, whether you know, and I talk about a lot of black guys because I got a lot of black friends. They're tough, tough street kids, man. They're killing like crazy in every neighborhood, you know. Still, so when guys talk to me about that, I said, man, stop telling me about this bullshit. That you know, the mob is organized in a different way. But as far as if you got, like I said three or four or five guys that are legitimately killers with you. And ain't nobody saying nothing. All that made guy and titles don't mean nothing when you get when you got guys that'll do this. And then everybody shuts the fuck up because they know they'll run through you. You know, you'll come in, you'll run through guys. I mean, in this day and age, there's cameras everywhere, so everybody talks bullshit. Because, you know, there's cameras. They know you can't do anything. There was no cameras, trust me. If we shut down the cameras everywhere, You'll see all those gangsters on those computers stop typing because then they know, they know they're, they're open game. It's like going hunting again. You can take whoever you want. Because all the damage you've done, is that why a lot of people got away with stuff back then? Because there was no CCTV? Yeah, there was no CCTV. You could do what you want. If you had balls, you could do what you want. You, you, you got a big drug dealer, you go see him, you warn him, you do business with me. And if the guy doesn't, listen, a lot of guys are stupid. You know, they, they, you know, they got egos, they talk shit, they're gonna do this, but they're not really about that. And then when you got a real serious guys, a group of guys, we had serious guys, Andrew Costelli, he's dead. He was a serious guy. Frankie Burke, Jimmy Burke's on, he's dead. He was a serious guy. Tito, he got killed by Frankie, but he stayed with us. He's dead, Joey Danka. We all put work, all of us were putting work. In. So it's not one guy, Greg Ryder, he's dead. Dennis Pittman, Kevin Pittman, they're dead. I go through this all the time when I'm talking about different people. Scott Schumann, wild guy. He got killed, shot him 35 times. That's our whole crew of guys we stayed. Some of the guys were a little closer than other guys. We all stayed in one bar together. Everybody's dead. There's nobody that's alive. You know, so all of us, we just, and everybody was shooters. It wasn't just like I was a shooter. They were all shooters, all these guys. So, you know, if we had a problem, I'd call him, hey, Angelo, take a ride with me. You know he's in. He's game. He's going to come. You call Joey Danker. Joe, take a ride with me. No problem, brother. You come and, you know, we pick each other up and all of us are doing work. We're all, you know, we found out somebody had a half a million dollars in, in a house somewhere we're going. We're going to go take it. And we don't wear masks. Never. None of us. We just go face up. If you come back looking for us, you know what we're going to do to you. Yeah, I'm surprised that. Is that because there's so many coppers on the pay as well? Yeah, we had a lot of cops. You know, I had the guy, Phil Baroni, the, the <clears throat> detective. He killed with me. He was my drug partner. He was my bookmaker partner. He had other cops that worked under him. So, you know, I'm bringing a load of drugs. He's in the car with me. I got pulled over one, one time for sure that we got pulled over bad. Another time, he seen him pull me over. He pulled up. He just happened to be there. And so, you know, he, he handled that part of any, like, just local police or somebody pulling you over for some dumb shit. He flashed his badge and that was that. So, you know, we had that, you know, so we have a lot of that too. You have guys moving drugs for me that were cops. 
Uh, I had different drug spots in Brooklyn and, you know, in, in the area. It was a different era. It was a completely different era. See, when you're killing people, John, stabbing people, beating people up, see the screams that ever play in your mind now, nightmares. I mean, I don't sleep good, so subconsciously, you know, people say, ah, oh, you know, because once in a while, listen, I just got mad. A guy put the tape up, uh, this uh, Nadu kid. I abused the shit out of him. And the only reason they talk like this is they know you're not going to do nothing anymore. They're challenging you who you are, talking bullshit about you, putting a tape up like that. If he ever did that years ago, I'd go send that chop his head off. I was, you know, but it's a different era, so you got to lose the ego. But yeah, that stuff bothers you. But yet, it, like I always say, it's your DNA. Nothing's going to change in you. You know, this is who you are. You just learn to control it. You learn to control your ego. You learn to, you want a different life. You know, because when you do what you used to do with suicide, I might as well kill myself. What, what was your daily routine like back in the day? What, which was your that? Your daily routine. What was it like? Uh, we'd be out every night drinking champagne, a bunch of us and different, you know, back then we always dressed suit and ties and uh, there would be a gang of us. This guy Richie would be what us, Joey Blue Eyes. I mean, there was a ton of us. And we'd be in, you know, we'd be out every night champagne and it all different girls with us, every crew. We'd fly all over the place. You know, back then you could fly at any hour. We'd go to the islands, we'd go to Florida, we'd go to California. We'd be in the Bahamas. And then during the day, we'd get up on a regular and do our drug business. Go and collect, go call, let our guys call us if they had a problem at a bar with another guy. If another guy started selling drugs at that bar, they'd give me the name. I'd send a couple guys to him. If the guy doesn't listen, I'd go hurt him, you know, bat him. If it's a little more serious, you shoot him. Um, it's just, that's your money. You're just following your money around. How much were you making back then? Uh, big money. I mean, uh, you know, guys ask me all the time. You got to remember, we're moving four keys basically in about a week or two in pieces. In quarter grams, half grams, grams, little eight balls. And then we got weight that we're moving and... I had so many guys. I mean, we're making, you know, a million a month. I, it's hard to even put a number on it because I got guys like Guy Peen, Andrew Rizzavuto, I got Joey Danka, Ronnie Warnham. We all got guys, Tommy, Chrissy, I'm name some of the guys at Fat Angelo. These guys are all around with me and I'm supplying them all and they all got guys. So uh, Frankie Scarpanito, uh, Keith Croce. So th and these guys all got guys under my guys. This guy, Joey Squiggs. So say I give just small amount. I give each guy two kilos, there's 10 guys, that's 20 kilos. They're gonna break it up in pieces, they're gonna move it around the neighborhood and they got, I don't know how many guys working for them. Then they got guys like Guy Pete that comes to me and he's taking four to 10 keys a month and we're flipping those. It's very hard to say because there's too much money. We're, we're going out for every, every uh, 10 grams you give these guys, they're supposed to bring you back 700, they get 300 for your workers back in those days. And you know, if they give discounts and whatever, and sometimes if we got some real good blower to go up to 120 a gram. So, I mean, I'm just giving you some quick numbers. How much percentage goes to the bosses? And I said, well, you're hiding money. It depends on what you get. We had some spots, we had the one spot flight 116, the guy there, Moose, would give me and Gotti 800 a week just for the spot. So we'd make 1600 on the corner, plus we would supply him. And then at the end of the week, depending what he told me, he moved, you know, he would give us a percentage of that. But the problem is, you know, people say, well, how do you know he's not moving something else? Because we used to check, we'd have guys buy. I know our own product, you know, would be marked up products, whatever we, at that time, I forget what some of the names would call it, but, you know, and we'd, package it in certain things. If we found out somebody was moving something else, that means they're not buying from us and they're making, maybe they're moving a key without us. And if you find out you get hurt, you get killed, you get shot up, you get batted. So guys didn't do it. Actually, Moose was pretty loyal. He didn't do it. But then you had another guy, Glenn Erskowitz, that had nothing to do with me. He used to just give it to God. He'd, that'd be enough. Yeah, and you're talking about a different era. You give him about 500, I think, a week out of that spot. These are only a couple spots. We had a hundred spots. Do you have a photographic memory? I got a pretty good memory. I remember names too. You see me throwing the fuck out do names. You remember these names from 30, yeah, yeah, 40 yeah. years ago. Yeah. That's yeah. why when guys talk and question me, I, I, I say their whole names. I give names. I give locations. You know, we had a dust spot with Tony DeMeo up in Forest Park. We had another place by the dome. Uh, we had Johnny Lito there. 
you know, he was moving, these guys were moving back in those days, Black Beauties and uh, Dust and uh, Angel Dust and, and Coke, so. Is that to verify everything you're saying? Yeah, that's what I said. Everybody's, you know, some of the guys that ain't alive, but I'm giving names. I'm giving locations. I'm not just saying, oh, this guy over here. Like, you know, so when guys, do, you know, when guys talk all the time, I'm always telling them the same thing. You could talk, but I'm very direct because I got good memory. I remember everybody's names. Mm -hmm. I remember guys that can list names from prisons that were with me that know me good from, you know, from whether it's Brazil or prison in 1991. Yeah, you know, I remember my my cellmate in 1991. His name's Alex Garrett. He's an ex-fighter, tough guy, gangster, black guy. We were good friends. I mean, I just name names all day. With so many people, or so many egos involved in the mafia, so much pride. So everybody want to be top dog. For someone from Albania, someone who was dangerous, a hitman, making money, how far could you have went? You know, people can say what they want. I took over the streets. I'm alive still. If I was that bullshit guy that, you know, because you, if you watch a lot of these shows or you watch them type, they blast away at me. And, and I, I laugh. I said, I'm Donald Trump with a mob. I just talk because I let it roll off my shoulders. I know what they are. Because if they're real men and they're killed, they ain't going to be writing that nonsense. I said, they write like idiots. But I wouldn't be sitting here if I wasn't what I was, especially making the money, especially for every country I lived in. I lived in Colombia, I lived in Cuba, I lived in Africa, I lived in Brazil, I lived in Brazil penitentiaries for almost three years. You're not gonna stand here and sit here if you're full of shit. Guys are gonna, eventually your card gets pulled by somebody and they kill you. You know, and, and in our life, we all get stabbed up, jumped, batted. It's part of the life. But as an Albanian, and you don't want people to say that, there's only one thing that rules the streets. It's, it's the violence and the money. And if you're violent, and, and you're smart and you have a crew, you're gonna do whatever you wanna do really. You know, people tell you any bullshit and I'm always talking about Irish guys and serious tough guys. It doesn't matter if they're tough, they're tough. And, and then if somebody can't put you on their lap, that means they gotta try to hit you a different way. They gotta do a drive-by, they gotta try to catch you somewhere. And if they miss, they know you're gonna come after them. Yeah. And they know what you're gonna do if they come after them. So that fear factor of, you know, it was like Roy DeMeo. Nobody wanted to kill him. Why? The home too dangerous. I did a show on him the other day. I wrote a list of names. I read a list of names a guy killed. Killed about 30, 30, 35 names I read off. So that's just a, what we know. Who knows how many he killed besides that with his crew. And the way they killed him was his crew killed him. So see, because see, because of so many killers as well, was there, was there people who were frightened of other killers even though they were killers? You're not afraid. It's, you know, people ask me all the time, are you worried about it? Well, I wouldn't be worried about it if I'm, you see, how'd I come here? I'm in New York by myself. <laughs> you know, it's just part of it. If it happens, it happens. I mean, I've been stabbed up a couple of times. I've been jumped. And, you know, people talk shit. You're not invincible. They, they can get you. So it, it's part of it, but it's like a boxer. You get a fighter, he goes in the ring. You don't give a fuck who he's fighting. He fights. You know, you're going to win, lose, doesn't matter. You know, you're going to fight. And, in this mentality, it's the same thing. You know what, you're gonna, you're gonna do business. You're gonna try to align yourself. It's like yourself, if you were on the street, I would try to be your friend and do business with you. But if it doesn't work like that, and I feel you challenging me instead of working with me, and then I'm not gonna say nothing to you. We're just gonna let it go. We're gonna act like we're friends with each other. And then maybe I'll tell two guys, let's take this guy out next week. If, if we feel you stepping on our toes. But it's better to get along and make money together. So you do, you do try to make alliances, don't get me wrong. I had alliances with every crew around, whether they were gangs, street gangs, whether they were the Bloods, whether they were, you know, uh, uh, a black gang, uh, the Black Hawks, there were a motorcycle gang, excuse me, Tomahawks. Well, whoever it is, you're trying to, you're trying to, uh, you're trying to have alliances to make money. You know, one of my friends at the time, Hell's Angel, he was the president here in New York, I, you know, his sister was my uh, girlfriend as a kid. You know, obviously I was very close with him. Uh, he died since, but you know, so you had alliances with guys and you make money with them. And if there's a problem you can't handle, then he would send somebody through his guys. And that's the good thing about alliances across, you know, every country, not just here. You know, when I went to Colombia, when I was in Brazil, Commander Vimelo was the, is the, is the big outfit there. And I was in prisons with these guys and some of the bosses were my friends and we got involved in things together. So, yeah, I mean, this is part of how you survive and you make deals and, 
And when you're talking about, uh, you know, you go to East New York back then, I had in Brooklyn, I had a lot of black friends. So I'd go into another guy goes in there that it's not going to work out so well for him, you know, because, they, you know, I used to pull up, leave my car running in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, Brownsville. And, you know, somebody will say to me, I still go to Brownsville a lot. I have a lot of guys and I do talks and out for kids. So, you know, but they, they know, they all know me from school, from hanging out in the neighborhood, from Jamaica Avenue. And, you know, it's just, it just depends on, on who you, how, how smart you are and uh, how loyal you are to the people you're making money with. What sort of levels of violence is there, John? So if someone was chatting up a gangster's wife or someone owed a thousand dollars, is there one's okay, just beat him up or is everybody just getting killed off and stabbed and whether they live or die, it's, there's a different levels to it from what people owe or what they've done? Yeah, it's levels to it because it depends on what they've done. Like, you know, a guy does, hurts one of my guys that are on the street that's moving drugs for me. I can't allow that. I might not kill him, but, you know, you're going to hurt him. You're going to bat him. You're going to hit him with a bat. You're going to, you know, you're going to make sure that he understands. Don't ever go near one of your guys again. You know, if a guy goes into one of my bars, because, you know, I had a ton of bars. I don't know, 60, 70, 80, 100 bars. We're, we're moving drugs everywhere. If you're going to come in there and think you're going to move packages in there, and my guy tells my, whoever he works for, they let John know this guy's starting to move packages in here. We'll go to him, and I'll tell him, you want to move, you got to buy through us. Because if, if you don't buy for us, and if we catch him after that warning, if he doesn't buy from us and he's in there, then we hurt him. And this is how we control the drug business in our sections. You've done a lot of violence yourself, why? But just going yourself, I mean, like, you never had your crew. You you done a lot of damage. Alone. I mean, I had, I had guys that did work for me also, but mostly I did it. Yeah. Why? So it's done right. So you make I make sure I do what I want to do. I sent two guys and uh, actually three, and I told them to to hurt this guy but don't kill him, and I gave him the wrong bullets in the gun purposely. A guy testified on this. He was testifying against us and he tells the story and everybody's laughing because they're making fun of us saying, look how stupid that they put the wrong bullets in. But the witness for the government said, I'm the guy that John gave the gun to and John told him these are the wrong bullets. He says, but give it to them because he knows they're too stupid. No matter what he tells them, they're going to try to kill the guy. So they stabbed the guy, which I didn't want either, but they stabbed him. They robbed him. They tied him up and they tried to sh shoot him with the gun, the gun, they kept clicking the gun and, and it wouldn't go off, it was the wrong bullets. When did you feel your safest, John, in that life of crime? You're never safe in that life of crime. Never? Nah. You know, because a 16 year old kid can hit you. And it's that guy that wants to make a name for himself that wants to fight you. And I hear it till today, guys challenging me every day. They don't stop. Online is that talking because they want to make a name. They think if they get to say something about you online, that everybody says, "Wow, look at the way he talked to him." You know, so you know it's 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 what it is. You got to laugh at it. You know, once in a while you do get mad. People say, "Well, I thought you're working with kids. You're human. You lose your temper here and there." Yeah, and then, you, but you control it verbally is okay as long as you're not doing it physically. How does it heighten the paranoia? I don't, I'm not paranoid, man. I'll go to restaurants. People say to me all the time. I sit on my back to the door. I go anywhere I want. I mean, there's a couple of times since I've been home, guys try to jump in us, and that's part of it. You know, if they catch you short, you're drunk or you whatever, and you let your guard down. But then, you know, they know what's going to happen after that. And, you know, if uh, if they were real guys, trust me, the guys who were real guys, like in my day, I'd be dead. I wouldn't be sitting here because there wouldn't be no talking. If you had guys like, and I bring their names up a lot, you know, I bring up like Tabita and these guys that, and Fabi, guys that I'm real good friends with now, they used to be my enemies. When those guys were looking for you to kill you, if they found you, they ain't punching you, they're not doing any of that dumb shit. They're gonna sit there, they're gonna take you, and they're gonna kill you, they're gonna torture you, and oh, they're gonna they're gonna hit you good. They're gonna shoot you 10, 15 times, stab you up. They're real guys. Now, now you got a lot of fakers. They won't wanna fake their way and get a reputation. So, you know, they talk bullshit. For a man who loved that life, when did it start sinking in that? You started asking questions, what the fuck is it you're actually doing? Yeah, because I started noticing that, you know, I'm getting smarter, obviously, as I get older and I see the life and I see these guys ain't doing no work. They're full of shit. These guys didn't, you know, I, I've been abusing Sammy for a while now. I says, and some idiots write me, oh, he put the work in back then. I don't know what part of they don't get that he only killed one guy. 
He, he runs around all over TV. He's at 19. I'm good at murder and I'm good at this. He's full of shit. That's why I ask people when they talk to him, well, tell him since you, you killed so much, tell us who. Tell us the names. Tell me where you were when it happened. They don't do it because they weren't about that. They got, you know, I say he's the Kamala Harris to the Joe Biden and the vice president. He's there for fucking namesake of bullshit for, because politically it's, it's good for whatever reason. But he ain't that guy. He's not a Roy DeMeo, you know. So when these guys are talking that nonsense, they're not really guys putting in the work. There's guys that put in the work, and I know who they are, which guys are, are tough. And there's a lot of, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of mob guys that are tough guys. But he ain't one of them. And, you know, so when you, when you go through some of this and you say, I started realizing these guys ain't what they say they are. And then when I see, like, when I was on the run and I was worth millions, I mean, I lost... 35 million, and I say 35 was more than that because my nightclub alone was making three, four million a year. My parking company was sold for 17 and a half million. So, you know, my properties, I got a, a piece of state that's 10 million somebody else got now. But, you know, when I was sitting there, the whole mob was giving me up. I never got caught. So I said, then I started realizing, like, what, what the fuck am I doing? What do I believe in? I believe in bullshit. Every rule's broken, and everybody that I protected, now that I'm on the run, nobody's doing the right thing for me and the rest of them all ratting on me. So, you know, you, you know when I see everybody grass and I'm like, well, this organization is nonsense. It's people that don't know any better that believe in this crap. So how did you end up on the run, John? I went on run because I had police that worked for me that told me that they got two indictments down looking for me. And I ended up being on the, uh, the everybody was, Interpol was looking for me. I was on America's Most Wanted list. And I went from country to country. I had a lot of connections. One of my connections was my uh, good friend, big one of the biggest drug dealers in Denmark, the boss, Klaus, and we were in prison together in Brazil. So he helped me gather some passports in Europe, and I ended up in Cuba for a while, in and out, in Africa, where I picked up passports in Senegal. And then uh, I, I ran to 20 different countries in hiding. My country, I was in Albania for a while. And Interpol was on me, and... Uh, I knew that my time was limited. Too many guys giving me up, too many made guys, mafia guys. And uh, so I said, there's no way I'm gonna end up uh, okay through this. Uh, you can't kill everybody again. You could, every time somebody opens their mouth or somebody's ratting or somebody's just talking stupid, how many guys are you gonna kill? You just can't do it. And yet you kill one, there's another one. You do that, there's another one. You start learning as you get older. I had the wrong understanding of this life. And it's too late now, but I paid the price for it. When did you get caught? I got caught in 2004. Where? In Brazil. What they came that, with the army. Like? What were you thinking then? I was thinking I'm fucked. <laughs> 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 I was sitting on a corner. Uh, actually, I was fixing a guy up with a girl that I knew, Susan, and she, he went on the phone. And uh, I was on Copacabana, uh, behind uh, Copacabana Palace. It's like a four lane, loud, tourist everywhere, street that everybody's looking out the window at me. There's a helicopter above. And usually the helicopter's on the beach side. It was on the building side, which I knew right there. And then everybody's looking out the window. I see snipers, I see the army, military police coming after me and, and it's complete silence. And that's how you know you're finished. And they told me to put my hands up and get on the floor and I wouldn't do it. And people say, well, you know, and I wasn't trying to be a tough guy. So I'll be the first one to say, I guess somewhere subconsciously, I just said, ah, fuck it, let them kill me, it's over. So I, I, I wasn't putting my hands up. And then finally, I was just lucky that no, the, the guy that was running that uh, arrest was uh, a nice guy. Because he said to me afterwards, like, why the fuck did you just put your hands up? And I just went, I don't know. You know, I was disgusted. I was like, I don't know. I guess I just wanted them to shoot me. And, uh, you know, you didn't think about it at the time. It's just the way I reacted. And I was just, in, and the guy I was with wasn't a gangster. And he's going, hey, it ain't me. And they weren't 100% sure it was me. And he kept saying, yeah, it's me. And I looked at him like, hey, shut the fuck up. But, uh, you know, it's, and then that was it. I started getting shipped around to these penitentiaries. And I was the first guy ever in that country brought into a penitentiary without a charge in that country. So uh, I wasn't charged with a crime there. They were just holding me to bring me back. 
I was supposed to be in one jail and they ended up sending me to one of the worst prisons around. I didn't think they could, how could they extradite you because you were such a high profile name? I fought the extradition for a while, but you ain't beating those. Yeah. You once know. they, you know yourself, John, nah, once they want you, they'll get you. What are you thinking then? Because what sort of charges were you up for? I was up for everything. Every, <laughs> <laughs> they, they came for, they, my indictment came 30 years back. So it was from 1980 to 2005, uh, 2004, excuse me. And it was uh, murders, uh, armed robberies, uh, drug dealing, a certain amount of kilos of, you know, life sentences all. And uh, shootings, uh, I was accused of uh, a couple dozen shootings. And uh, it was just done. There was no way. And then once I was in penitentiary and, and the word was out that all these guys were talking against me, everybody that was going into court were blaming me. So uh, it, it was, it was, I knew it was over. So what was that then? If you're in that life of crime, you've done all the damage, you've done all the bad stuff, you would have died for that life, you were all about that life, to then reading statements that people have then turned on you and pointing the finger. When did you have that moment to go, oh, fuck this, I'm, I'm doing the same back? Was that a hard decision or was it an easy decision? Uh, no, it was a hard decision. I didn't do it. For three years, I'm sitting in the pens in Brazil, I wouldn't do it. And, you know, and those pens are, are, are real pens, not like our luxury, even the worst jails here is not like that. There, everybody's got guns, just killings left and right. You can't breathe. You'd sub below. There's no, no lights. You got a little bulb that goes out. This is because in third world country, the electric grid goes out. You shit in the floor. You got rats this big. You got mosquitoes. And you know, when people ask me that, all the guys are from the UK, just that we all stay together, still talk. And you know, so they did some interviews. They talk about what, you know, exactly how I was there. And, you know, me stabbing guys inside prison and, and different things. So, you know, the thing is, the survival there is very difficult. And there's guys from around the world, we're all in touch with each other. My friend, by the way, I want to say the hello to Nereo, because he just got in touch with me a couple months ago from Italy. And you got a lot of guys uh, that were with us. Another guy, Max Klaus, was with us. Guy Chimmy out of Turkey. Uh, uh, Justin from the UK. A uh, Lewis in the UK, we call him O. Um, so we're all, you know, we all stayed in touch with each other all these years because we survived because of each other. So, you know, when people talk about, uh, you know, it's concentration camp. But when I was sitting there, I held out. When I came home, I was with the, uh, a guy, a black guy that I got very friendly with. And he, I, I came back in and he told me, hey, brother, man, you better get with the game. And he was a, a disciple from Chicago. And uh, we used to play chess together. And I couldn't beat him, no matter what. This guy was a good chess player. I'm all right chess player. And uh, he said, you better get with the program. Who are you holding out for? You know, the, the, these guys are all giving you up, fucking you. I watch wise guy after wise guy come in here, made guys. And they're all just just blaming everything on you, every crime. There was a, there was a couple of trials while I was in Brazil, too. And the captain made opening statements about me and saying that uh, I'd kill him like everybody else. Uh, that I'm a rogue, a loose cannon, blah, blah, blah. But it woke me up. And then I says, I don't know any of these guys, nothing that's fucking me. So it's over for me. I'm not staying loyal to nothing now. They're not loyal to me. I'm not loyal to them. But I get a little kick out of the guys that talk, whether it's gangsters or whether it's just regular individual, you know, trolls on the, on the, on the uh, internet. Because they call everybody a rat. He's a rat, 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 rat. I got caught because everybody's ratting on me. <laughs> That's what I got. I never got caught. You know, I never got caught at a scene. I never got caught with guns. I never got caught killing nobody. I never got caught with drugs. So this nonsense they say, they're right. Everybody's a rat. They ratted on me. I owe no, and nobody, and I never had any qualms with it. After they all gave me up, I said, no, they, this life just fucked them. And, and also not just the guys that ratted on me when I asked the mob to go kill some of these guys that are ratting, nobody would do it. But it was okay when I was doing it for everybody. So then I, I woke up, I go, listen, I'm naive. It's about self-survival, these guys do. It's about money. It's, that's it. It's not about they like you or they love you or they, they're either afraid of you so they listen to you or you're making them money or when you're gone, you're expendable. New guy up and that's that. That's it, that's the life. Do you feel used? 
yeah, you, it's my own fault. I don't blame nobody. I'm used because I was stupid and I bought into the bullshit. I drank the Kool-Aid. You know, you can't blame nobody but myself. So see, when you're in court, you're back here, you've read the indictments, you've read everything against you. What sort of deal was put in place? You know, they don't give you a deal. You got assigned to life. So it's not what anybody thinks. You don't know what you're going to get. You know, so you're, you're fighting for your life, but the more that you tell them that you did, they're not supposed to use against you. And in Florida, that's where my indictment came. They started trying to use it against me. And uh, I, tried to get a, I tried to get a plea deal without talking to them at all. And I tried to get 22 years. They wouldn't give it to me. Then I went up to 35 years, and they wouldn't give me that. So that was it. So they, I think, I believe they wanted to give me a 37, I don't remember, something like that, high, crazy number. So everything you've told them you've done, that's why you can speak about I that. I can speak about today. it, it's all covered, yeah. And uh, so when I started talking about it, uh, I had no qualms. Like some guys will come in and, you know, they sat down with me at the table and there's bunch, a lot of people in the room. And they asked me, they thought I killed some guy, uh, Dennis Harrigan. So I said, I didn't kill him. But I killed him, I killed him, I killed him, I shot him. Yeah, I ordered the killing of him, and they were looked up, and I go, so now you know I'm serious. I'm going to give you what, what I'm going to give you. How could you have trusted them? Because you could have gave everybody up, gave yourself up, got life. You're known then. I was getting life anyway. Were you? I was getting life. So it was just that, was that a last option? Oh, yeah, I was getting life. Too many guys ratted on me. That, How many that, guys? That, over 60 guys. Over 60. So it's, it's not like one or two guys. Over 60 guys gave me up, went into grand juries, went in the, the talk, all my co-defendants were giving, everybody was giving me up. See, that's the, the, the thing is they called me a serial killer. They called me a loose cannon. They called me a rogue. They called me all these names. Then when I came out of jail, he never did anything. He's full of shit. You know, they got bold stories. But when, they, when someone says that to me, I says, well, then can you call up the FBI and tell them they owe me 20 years that I did combined because I didn't do anything? And call Interpol and tell them, take those videos down that I'm the most dangerous guy in Brazil and the the, the most important guy they ever caught in Brazil. And they and believe me, the way they treated me and beat me, and because I got beatings in there from the from the from their government, they had me chained up like a Hannibal Lecter with chains around my legs, my, my neck, my hands, black box me. They moved me around like that on a regular basis. They kept me in solitary confinement. Uh, th and these guys that were with me, everybody knows how they treated me, so. So when did it come to an end then, John? When I mentally said that I'm a jerk off for, for being loyal to guys that ain't loyal to me. Then I said, that's it, it's over. Was there anyone loyal in that life? Is there anybody you can look back on who was 100% done the damage, done their time in prison, never broke? No, nobody, nobody I, their business with or anybody I know. They all make their own justification of how they act. You know, and I did a lot of work and I helped a lot of guys in different families too. And when I reached out to them, oh, I'm sorry, you're hot. There's too much, you know, too much heat on you. I'm sorry, we, there's too many 302s. Guys are giving you up like crazy. We can't go near this. And I even asked to see guys that were involved with families, that seen lawyers of those families. Even the lawyers refused to come see me. Because they're, the guys they work for told them, no, don't go see them. Don't, you know, you got to stay away from There's too much violence in this case. So with your statements to anybody, how many people went to prison? I only testified in two trials. So the, the one trial I testified was uh, Charles Koenig. And he went to jail. He got life. And, and who's he? And he's, I, he's not a gangster. Shouldn't have never been. He was a gangster. They made him. He was Johnny uh, Koenig's brother. Nice guy. Johnny, I like, we all like them. Tough guy, funny guy, money guy. Uh, one of the loyalists of John Gotti. He was uh, a good guy. Uh, his brother was a heroin addict, uh, a crackhead, did some low life crimes and uh, gave me guns to kill a couple of guys. And for $750, he gave up that to, to Cruz that I was gonna kill him. So I didn't owe him nothing, he's another guy. You know, sold me out, sold out Johnny Knig's stepson, uh, adopted son, excuse me. So when guys talk about this, they, they don't have knowledge because these guys already betrayed me. 
you know, all of them in different ways. So I don't have it. I don't feel any loyalty to him. If, if, you know, in jail, if he was with me in jail, I would have tried to kill him, but he wasn't. So that's just the way it is. You know, when people say to me, well, do you feel bad? No, nah, I don't feel bad. I says, you know, this guy did what he did to me. He asked me to do it, stay loyal to him and kill guys. And I said, yeah, no problem. Gave me the guns. And then you sell me out for, for a couple of dollars because you're a junkie. I mean, there's, there's, that's not a, there's nothing to say. He shouldn't have been made in the first place. He did some, like I said, he did some fucking low life killings and crimes that ain't mob related. So uh, I'm not with it. You know, I had my own set of rules. I'm surprised they gave, even gave you a deal, especially with the damage that you had done. I'm surprised they didn't just want you in. Well, the United States is, is the, the way the United States works is, especially depending on what they want. Like that's why they gave 60 something guys deals off of me. Guys were getting hardly anything. They went to trials. They should have got life. They didn't do what I did. They went to trial, lost the trial, then they gave me up. And they did nothing. A couple of years, two years, three years, five years. The problem is they all wanted me. Um, and even the way they came to get me, when they got me in Brazil, they didn't put me on a commercial plane. They put me on a Gulfstream 5 with a dozen agents coming to get me. This is how bad they wanted me. So, you know, when, when, when they come after you like that, it, you know, there's... There's nothing to say. You're done. It's the United States of America. <laughs> you know, it's not like, you know, it's this little town that's coming after you. The United States of America wanted me. My time on the street was finished. And uh, the mob betrayed me. It's not, you know, like I said, once the mob betrayed me, it was over from there. And uh, I, I was disgusted at the time, obviously, because I believed in these guys. And while I was sitting in those penitentiaries and I left my family, I left all that money and one after another just giving me up. And guys used to tell me all the time in the pen in Brazil, why are you even waiting? These guys are all ratting on you. Do something, save yourself your life. And I just kept, nah, nah, nah. Because I believed in that craziness and brainwashed myself into thinking I'm being loyal to something that's not being loyal to me. So, you know, I, you know, guys talk like I, I ran into a guy that I know and he was talking bullshit and he was sitting at the table. I said, hey, let me ask you something. If you were in jail and your wife just banged six guys because you went to church and said you're going to stay married forever, you're going to be loyal to her. And he looked at me, I go, answer the fucking question. And then, you know, I got a little more rude with him about his wife. I said, so you're going to stay loyal to her. You all want nothing, don't you? It's the same with you fucking guys. I owe none of nothing. You just fuck me, I fuck you back. That's it. It's, I can't kill 60 of you. It's, you know, it's, it's done. When did you get out? Uh, I got out in 2000, end of two, oh, about 2013. I think the end of 2012, 2013, something like that. What did you end up doing? How big a sentence? Uh, my whole sentence, I did 10 years on this case. And my whole time I did, uh, I was supposed to get eight and a half years credit for Brazil. I got the, they gave me a three years, they didn't give me any credit. I should have got 10 years, uh, eight and a half years credit for the time because of the, the way you do your time. I did four years prior to that. I did a year or two prior to that, then a year. So I did about 18 years, total 18 and a half years. Did you have to go into protection? No, I never did none of that shit. And then, you know, that's another <laughs> thing. When people talk about that. That's what people tell them snitch that they, they end up I, in They forced me and anybody that, that was in prison with me in Florida, knows they couldn't get me into a solitary consumptive cell. I was fighting them left and right to stay on the tears. And anybody knows me, everybody knew the story. So I, you know, to me, I said, I ain't going nowhere. They should go witness protection. They're the ones that ratted me out. So I wouldn't go. I was staying in, and then somebody dropped a note on me finally and said they were going to hit me inside the jail, and they grabbed me, and I was fighting that. And I was like, let them hit me. They're stuck here with me. I'll hit them. And then that's, that's when they put me into solitary that that was the end of it after that yeah because it's a free for all but it took me it took me for uh it took them a while to, to get me locked down but right after that i came right back to my neighborhood i still live right here so when guys are talking I'm like listen i ain't hiding i didn't betray them they betrayed me <laughs> so, you know the, the, so there's nothing to say any time anybody talks any bullshit i want to tell all these gangsters i say it all the time there's so many guys they grassed out here bosses why don't you fucking kill them you gangsters, right? You just do a lot of talking, but you just didn't do what we did in my generation. There are guys like me. You know, they talk, they talk a lot of nonsense, but they ain't, they ain't doing nothing. And and I can tell you every rule, they've broke all of them. What you are know? the rules and the mafia, John? 
Uh, yeah. Supposedly? Supposedly. You can't admit to the existence of the mafia. They all admit because they get three years off their sentence now. So even though they say that's not a rat, it is a rat. It's probably one of our rules because they, if you're a, a mob guy, they got to prove that you're a mob guy. But since these last hundred guys just said the mob exists, that's good enough to give you the extra time. I says, you're not allowed to, uh, to uh, plead to a, a position in a mob that you're a made guy, you're an associate, you're a captain, you're a boss. They all do that too because they save two, three years. You're not, you know, so th these are all the things that these guys do. You're not allowed to sell drugs. We all fucking sell drugs. You're not allowed to talk to the media. They all talk to the media. You're not allowed to write books. They're writing books. You're not allowed to be on podcasts. They're on podcasts. You're not allowed to uh, put your hands on another made guy. They do. You're supposed to kill a guy that's a made guy. If you put your hands, they don't do that. You're supposed to be responsible for the guys that rat. So if they were responsible for all the guys that ratted on me, I wouldn't be in jail. But they don't want to kill the guys that ratted. Why don't you kill your guys? It's just that was ratting. So I, I can go on. So there is no fucking loyalty. They're not supposed to touch my personal money. It ain't the mob's money. They went and touched my personal money. Uh, you know, they're not supposed to send anybody to speak to my wife. They send guys to my wife's house. You're not as well, you're not supposed to take my ex-wife and put her on a date with another made guy. They did that too when I was in jail. So they did everything to me to make me, if I could have killed them, I would have killed them. Don't get me wrong, but I couldn't. And it was just too many of them. So it was, it was done. The coppers must just sit back and laugh. Yeah, they laugh, of they course. They must just think, fuck, see, I'll see you in five years when you are all turning on each other or you have killed each other. They must just sit back and rub their hands. If, if you watch guys make excuses why they met with the FBI, you watch guys wearing wires like Joe Messina, the last boss. Who are they bullshitting? What kids are they bullshitting? They were all right. If you watch Sammy Gravano talking shit and he's hiding in Arizona, is Sammy in here that we don't know? Is he hiding under the bed? Because why ain't he here, right? They want to go by titles. Where the fuck is he? I'm here. Where's he? This is the point. Like when guys talk shit, well, if he's such a tough guy, where the fuck are you? Not just him, all these bosses. Because years ago, they didn't rat the bosses because they didn't have Rico. As soon as Rico came, they rat more the underlings. They make guys as a made member of the mob in their underwear. And I left because one of my friends got made in his underwear. I says, why don't you tell your fucking bosses that we're making you get in your underwear. You're the guys that are setting us up. We do the work and then you set us up. So, you know, it, it's a, it, it, who's buying into this? I don't know. And of course they're gonna attack me the way they do because look at the way I talk. Was there anybody you respected in that life and still do now? Yeah, I respect a lot. Of, I respected Johnny Kinney a lot. I Who's always he? talk about it. He's one of the, one of John Gotti's main guys over the years. He got locked up for uh, heroin. He did a lot of time. He did about 30 something years and uh, 30 years. And uh, good guy, tough guy, didn't act like a jerk off. Uh, always in, you know, boats and motorcycles and Harleys. And, and he was a real guy, you know, he wasn't. So I, I like him because he wasn't, he's one of those guys that did put in work. He's one of those guys that did do those that time. He's one of those guys that were good to the guys, to the younger guys, to see, all of us. See the Gotti, the new one on Netflix, listen, I, I love it as well. I love the stories, even listen to yourself, John. I love them because they're, they're exciting, they're interesting, they're mad as fuck. But even the Gotti thing that I watched, I couldn't understand why he was using the phone. I don't get it. I don't understand then. Surely he must have knew that they were wired. You know what the problem is? It's hard day and night not to talk. You know, we go to a cafe. You forget. It's not that you forget. It's just, it's almost impossible not to talk. Eventually you're going to talk and you're going to say like, for 99 hours in a row, you didn't talk. But if you talk for two minutes, that two minutes gets your life. Yeah. You're in a car, you can't talk. You go to the same restaurant, you can't talk. You know, people think that they got to bug this table. They have ones that bug the whole room. So if you're sitting at that table, that table, that table, if you frequent there and they know you frequent there, they bug it, they get you. You're walking in the street, they bug the uh, the meters where you're walking. They bug, people wear wires on you. I mean, they on and on and on. It's 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 just, it's just not a good life. That's why I say the, the truth. What idiot says this is a good life is a fucking liar. The only ones that think it's a good life are the frauds, the fakers. 
They're white collar criminals. They go out and they do bullshit things. They're not killing nobody. They're not shooting nobody. They're not going out stabbing nobody. They're not getting stabbed, shot. They've never been to jails. I, I, no one's th did a deep dive in the mob now and, and see how many of these guys go to prison. They don't want to do nothing. You know, they, they, so, you know, they, they talk like tough guys because, you know, they'll run around with 10 guys. They're fucking cowards and they'll jump one guy. You know, they're not, they're not doing any work. They're not shooting and they know nobody's going to kill them anymore. Same thing because they know there's, there's the same thing I know. There's cameras everywhere. But those same guys have been around 20 and 30 years ago. There was no cameras back then. They never did fucking shit all. So if they didn't do it then when there was no cameras, they ain't going to start now. You know, so. Yeah. What's the mafia like now? Is it start force or is everything kind of fizzling out? It's fizzling out. I mean, there's some of the old timers are gangsters. Like I said, there's a percentage of gangsters that I respect that I say are gangsters. I mean, respect them for what they are. I don't want to be in that life. But there's got to be, you know, 5% of them are real. You know, 10% of them are real. The other 90% aren't. You know, the other 90% are full of shit cowards. And, the you know, 5 or 10% are real guys. There's some tough guys out there that I grew up with that I know are, are serious guys, intelligent guys, money-making guys. But they know them themselves in their heart. They can't trust nobody. Here's the thing. If you're a guy and you're a real guy and you're going to take it to the end, how are you going to take an order from your boss knowing maybe your boss is going to be a rat like these other bosses? This is not like years ago. So you take an order and this guy decides to flip, you're done. Or how about if you're one of those bosses, how are you going to give an order to an underling and then the guy gets caught with something else? He doesn't even got to get caught. One of his kids get caught in something. And he says, well, I got to give up to save my kid's life. And he's going to give up his boss. This, this way it's over now. This new shit with Rico and people say years ago, guys didn't flip like this. Years ago, guys didn't get life sentences like this. Now they're hitting you over the head with life sentences. But before, if you get 30 years, you do a third of it. You do 10 years. You, you hit the parole board. It's a different world now. What's the worst thing about being in the mafia, John? The worst thing is you destroy your family. You know, your family, whether you like it or not, people, like I say it all the time, if any, if I ever was going to do something again, it would be because somebody did something to my family. You know, you know, guys are fucking cowards. They mix. I'm around every day. So if you want to do something, here I am. But I, I say the same thing in a, in, a, in a way. I don't want nothing. I'm not fucking with nobody's money. I'm just saying, don't fuck with me because... My DNA is never going to change. It didn't go, change all of a sudden one day and go, oh, this guy's a different guy. No, he, he's a different guy that controls himself. He's a different guy that doesn't have an ego. He's a different guy that wants a different life. So all those other guys that you're involved with on the street, whoever they may be, go fuck with them. They're fucking with your money. I'm not. Even though you know how dark and how much destruction that life causes, not just with yourself, but everybody around you, do you miss it? You miss the excitement. I always say that. But is it worth the excitement? Of course not. You know, when people say that you miss it, of course you miss it. You know, you, you, because that's our life. You can't erase your life. There was a lot of, you know, joking. Listen, we joke a lot too. The, the guys that I liked, you know, we'd have some fun. We joke. But is it worth it? Not at all. It's, you got to be an idiot to say it was worth it. And you know how much suffering we do? And, you know, people talk about, you know, oh, he thinks a tough guy, this guy. no. I'm honest about everything. You sit, then you cry your eyes out. You cry your eyes out in your cell, you get up, you wipe them, and if you gotta kill somebody after, you do. You go to court, you cry because you, it's your life and stress and what you did to your family, but then you wipe them again, and if you gotta bust somebody's head, you do. Just human. But people don't like to hear the truth, right? You know, so I, I hear a lot of that all the time. I know a guy's full of shit, he hit his wife. Yeah, I did. I don't lie. I shouldn't have did it, but I did. I wasn't a beat her but i slapped her i shouldn't have slapped her you know i just i just talk honest because i want kids to really know the truth about this life i know gangsters from every ass every crew every that are friends of mine that are out of life too and you know whether they're spanish whether they're black whether they're italian whether and we all say the same thing you know i go to church now i talk about god i go uh and i got a different outlook on life you know but Listen, same human being, you just don't want to cross that line anymore. Is there a lot of suicide in that life, John? Because I know a lot of army men who see killings and shootings. I know a lot of gangsters as well, so-called tough men who've 
just couldn't handle what they've seen or what they've done in life, take their own life? Was there a lot of suicide in your life? Oh, there's a lot of suicide. Greg De Palma killed himself. Louis Torrey killed himself in jail. They, uh, Greg was started to rat. He didn't want to rat. He killed himself. Louis, De, Louis Torrey, uh, same thing. He went in there. He didn't rat. He didn't want to rat. His uncle ratted him out, and he didn't want to rat. He killed himself. A kid from Canada, I won't say his name, but it's recent. He just killed himself. Uh, yeah, there's a lot. I've got PTSD, you know, so, you know, I'm not ashamed to say it. I say it all the time. I got a lot of veteran friends. You know, we've seen a lot of action. We did a lot of things. So you suffer through some of that stuff. You have, uh, you know, you get into the emotional because of PTSD. You're fighting yourself not to, to, to go after guys because of PTSD. Um, it's listen, there's nothing good that could come out of that life. And if somebody says, I've said this on TV, if you're a movie actor, if you're a ball player, if you're a police officer, if you're an executive, if you're a lawyer, a doctor, a complete gangster, killer gangster, tough guy, what idiot wants to put their kids in this life? Not none of those people I just mentioned. If it was so good, they'd all put them in this life. And any gangster that throws their kid in this life, it's gotta be fucking serious garbage because he's gotta know what he's doing to his life. And there's guys out there to put their sons in this life and you know, because they want the money, they want them to collect from, they want this, and they justify in their mind, oh, he's only doing this. You're full of shit, you know what you're doing. You're choosing your ego, your greed over your child's life. And a lot of them lie to their kids and they admit their kids believe they're tough guys. And this is why the kids act the way they do because they don't know who's real or who isn't because their own father lies to them. See, when you're a stone cold killer, John, and you block everything out and you're just ruthless, when th when does the conscience then come into play that the damage you've done, the lies that you've took, does, did it ever hit you that, well, you were, sure. you were a violent man? Yeah, you know, I look back and I'm like, what the fuck was I thinking? It's like I'm talking about another guy now. You know, I know what's in me because I know when I lose my temper sometimes I think about well, what I would do to this guy. But I also know, look what I did to my family. And for the people who don't know, I lost my daughter last year. So did you and thank you. And that, that's the pain that you'll never forget. And then I start thinking about pain I caused other people. Even though they were gangsters just like me. I didn't I don't have any crimes against like other people. It's I, billions. Yeah, I don't have any bad crimes. I never killed anybody like an armored guard or anything. None of that. That's not me. I never robbed a, a, even a drug dealer and killed him. I didn't believe in that. I didn't believe in killing about money. <laughs> I, I, I killed, and this is me trying to justify it, I guess. I killed guys that were trying to kill me and guys that were trying to make moves against us, money-wise, whatever. Who were, they're trying to rob us. That's what I'm talking But I wouldn't kill them by just robbing them. I'd take it and tell them, if you come after me, we'll kill you. But it, those are my own set of rules to justify, I guess, in my head, the shitty life. Yeah, because yeah. when you're in that life, like you see, you're cold, you're just trying to do a job and you feel it's normal. But see, when... It then hits you because obviously every mother and father will always love their son and daughter no matter what so when you're taking lives their mums and dad the destruction even if someone took your life the destruction and the pain your dad would have had to went through so see when you're taking other people's lives and i know your your daughter god rest her soul passed away with an overdose did that then sink in even more like the destruction of losing sons and daughters yeah of course it does you know what the worst feeling in the world is is two actually this is the worst feeling at five in the morning, please. Because when you kill somebody, every day you're waiting for that door to be knocked on. And that never goes away. You will never have peace in your life again. Because you're waiting for that door's gonna get knocked. And mostly, if people think they're getting away with it, they're crazy. It carries with them for a while. Just one murder. And the other thing is, when you're in prison and you hear the jingle of the keys all day, those fucking keys, you just want to throw, Kill the guy that's walking with those keys because you can't stand the opening those doors, every steel door through the thing, locking and slamming cages. It's th those two things are probably are the things that will haunt you the most about prison is that and the door. You know that door is going to get knocked on when you're doing the things we're doing. When you go to jail for like bullshit stuff, you know you're coming out. When we're in jail, guys that do work, you never have a peaceful moment because you know you're waiting for them to come get you when you're in jail too and hit you with the next charge. Now, even though you suffer through what you used to do, 
you got a clear conscience, you're not gonna go back to jail for fucking, no one's knocking on your door and say, well, you killed this guy again, uh, let's go. Because you only, you know, you only get one life and you only get all those years I cheated myself and my kids out of spending time with me. For what? For the, for, for the guys that I thought I was loyal to? The guys that ain't loyal? The guys that wouldn't crack an egg? The, 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 all these bullshit guys that tell you they're gangsters because they put on a suit and tie? and they smoke a cigar, and you, you don't know, but if you actually sat down, and I've asked a lot of guys this, why aren't any of you guys that are doing these interviews asking them? Walk me through each guy you killed, tell me how it happened. They kill us, they say they are. They say they're shooters, they say they're hitmen. Okay, so tell me, this guy, what was his name? Where were you when you did it? How'd you shoot him? How'd you set it up? What day did you kill him? What year did you kill him? What location did you kill him? Go to the next guy. Tell me when you shot him. Tell me how you killed him. Then go to the guys you kill, you shot only. Tell us. Trust me. Most of them, you're going to end at one. Yeah. No, for, uh, most of them, zero, the ones that are on straight now. For me, like, for families, I've written, John, for me, is everything for me. Like my kids, my mum, my sister, my brother-in-law. You just, had a rough life as a kid. Yeah, yeah. I you know, for the prison, people that don't yeah, know, yeah. I know. Yeah, you had yeah, a rough yeah. life as a and, and the smartest thing you ever did is... <laughs> is turn your life around. I got two of my best friends since we kids. They're not fighters. They're the biggest men and gentlemen around. You don't got to do what we do to be a man. That's the misconception that everybody thinks. Oh, yeah. The guys that do what I did are fucking idiots. Honestly. It's with idiots, just egos. And you can't control your temper before. You're very impulsive. I learned to control it now, but I didn't before. I was impulsive. Somebody did something, I wanted to go after them. Somebody said something, I wanted to go after them. I, wherever it was, whether it was, I, and I did it everywhere, in stores, in the daytime, in the street. I went through the windows in the house. I did everything. Now I learned to control that because it's not, it's about having a decent life and living with yourself, you know, and, and God has a lot to do with that, to be honest. With you. Did you ever get therapy, John? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always went there. And that, that's why I said I'm very open. I talk about everything. Went to therapy for years. And, you know, and it helps me, you know, the, listen, I got a temper. It's still, I always got a temper. Everybody has. Everybody's got a killer in them. I don't give a f yeah. I had an amazing woman on, Sarah Sands, who I'm amazing friends with now. One of the, an old man that abused her son, she got a blade, went round and plugged the cunt, killed him. Yeah. A woman. Everybody's got it in them. It's just about having that element of control. And the, all the people I interview, you'll tend to see everyone have a tough upbringings broken homes bullied or abused when they're younger they then use that violence for a defense mechanism because they're broken every violent man i know is because they're broken it's not because they're tough they're hiding something and that's from my own personal opinion just going through life and interviewing some amazing people but you tend to see it's because they're broken john but you know what i you know you're right but what i'm gonna tell you something one of the biggest things i learned as a kid and i always and i still carry it I respect everybody. A 16-year-old kid, I show him respect. Because that 16-year-old kid's probably more dangerous than most people even realize. But I always show him respect. And I think when you're in jail a lot of years and you're secure with yourself, because you know what you are, you don't try to abuse people. You don't try to take advantage of people. You don't try to talk down to people. But all the, the, the cunts, they do that. Because they know in their heart they're, they're cunts. They know they're not... They're not men, they're not tough guys, they're not serious guys. And I'm not talking about tough guys being killers either. I'm just talking about tough guys as a family man, tough guys that go through things. Mm -hmm. People that go through things through life, all the, the heartache in life, are generally nicer to people. It's these insecure people that do that because they got no good life. They don't have a good family life. They don't have a good job. They don't have the ability or confidence to do something. So this is what they do, because I don't know, I know you don't do it, and I guarantee, you know, I don't do it. Do you get up in the morning and go on a computer and see some guy and start writing on his page? Do you know how many guys do that to me? I'm like, what kind of fucking life do you have? You're a man. You don't like what I say. What are you watching it for? What are you writing it? You're all, you're, you know how many, a guy just wrote me last week and then I wrote him back shitty. And then he's trying to threaten me, like, you know, because he knows what he's doing. He's on me. And I'm like, hey, motherfucker. Fucker, you are writing me. You're bothering me. I didn't bother you. You can have your opinion. Go have it. I ain't writing on your pages. I ain't writing you DMs. I'm not following you around. Why you following me? Go follow your wife. Go follow your kids. 
What are you following me for? What's wrong with your life that you're following me? What are you frustrated? What are you so frustrated? You want to prove that you're tough? I know you're not tough or you wouldn't be writing that to me. And they don't get it though. Because if they were tough, they wouldn't do that. Yes. A real tough guy. I know a million real serious tough guys are such gentlemen. I ran into a guy in the summer in uh, Virginia. I didn't know the guy. He was sitting there with his girl. I was there with somebody. And back and forth, we kicked the conversation, shook his hand. And as I was leaving, I said to him, I know you've been down for a while. I said, I could tell just the way you carry yourself. You're a gentleman, strong guy, big guy, young guy. And he smiled. He goes, you can, you can tell? I go, 100%. I said, you know one of the reasons why I know? Just the way you're such a gentleman. You're not an insecure guy. I said, see you later. You know, and it was over because originally he was sitting in and I took the seat. I didn't know he was sitting there. He didn't come up like a tough guy. Hey, get off my seat. He didn't say that at all. He said, excuse me. You know, and he said it like a nice guy. And I said, no, no. And I went to get up. He goes, no, no, don't stay. But just the way he carried himself, you know the guy's real. Yeah. What's the biggest regret in that life, John? Yeah, it's got to be ruined my life. You know, you, you, listen, I can't, like I say, regret things because I regret my whole life. Would I do things different? A hundred percent. It's a shitty life. It's it's just not a good life. And everybody that tries to glamorize that life, it's there is no glamour. Is there excitement? Yeah. It, it's, it's not even close. Is it worth it to do it again? I would never do it again. You got to be a moron to want to do it again. All the suffering, all the loss of family, all the fucking hours of anxiety, pain, depression. How's it worth it? Do you believe in karma, John? Yeah, I believe in God. I don't know if this calm, I just believe in God. Uh, I believe that, you know, maybe there was a purpose behind it. That's why I talk to kids about it. Maybe that's why I talk the way I do. I'm very straightforward about the violence. And, you know, people say, oh, he's bragging about this. It's not bragging. It's not going to do with fucking bragging. It's a stupid thing people say. I'm just trying to be real of what was real, what wasn't real. And it's not worth it. And when you, when you, when you're really honest and you tell everybody about the crying part or the not sleeping part or, you know, what it was to, to blow someone's head off or to bat them to death, they watch too many movies. They don't get it. If they were sitting here, they'd throw up. They wouldn't even be able to stay in a room. You tell them, stay in a room. That's the way they'll learn. But you can't do it and get it back. If you could say, oh, you really want to see this since you got a big mouth? Yeah, watch. Watch when someone's dying. Watch what happens when there's blood all over you. Watch when they shit themselves. Watch the smell. Then they'll understand the same fucking TV. What's that like when you see a man dying? Did you just kill someone and move on, or did you actually watch them die? Watch them. And is that it, to make sure they're dead? No, you know. Are you getting some sort of kick from it? Usually you execute. I mean, you know, it depends on the situation. When they came to try, try to kill me on my property, yeah, I executed them. Uh, I mean, it, it depends. There's other guys like in a bar incident. I don't know if they're dead for sure. I mean, with Angela, when he was the shooter on that, uh, I mean, I would say they're dead. He got, I think they got hit with the 350 or a Magnum or something. He was a big, he had a big cannon. I just don't remember which, what type of gun it was. But most likely he's dead. He bled out. I mean, or if he, the one guy I thought for sure was dead right on the scene. The other guy probably bled out. He hit him in the back. Did uh, nobody find out? Was it not news, newspapers to find out if they were dead or not? You know, listen. There was all, no internet back then, was there? No, no. And, and you know what's funny? All the shootings I did, nobody ever knocked on my door. Not one cop ever knocked on my door. And just said something to me. You're under investigation. Or nothing. It's a completely different era. That's fucking nuts. That's nuts, I know. Do you ask for forgiveness through life or do you just try and do good to try and... You can never rectify the violence that you've done, but if you can stop kids from doing the same mistakes that you've done, then I believe it's still a great thing to do. But do you do you ask forgiveness anywhere the life that you've caused through oh, the years? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm listen. I go to church at least once a week. I go to chapel. I try to go a couple of times a week. Uh, I ask for forgiveness. I try to do the right thing. Help as many people that call me or write me. Uh, I mean, you know, and like I said, people will write me some bullshit and I'll write them back bullshit. You know, that sometimes depends if they catch me in the wrong mood because it sickens me when they do it, honestly. I don't even know. That, that's one thing I need to learn to get over because I can only imagine how kids kill themselves because of these fucking idiots that do that, teach other kids to do that. And then the, the, the kids that can't handle it kill themselves and get bullied 24-7. 
because you got these weak-minded people that have nothing better to do with their life but write dumb shit. Go on some of my shows. I mean, you got shows. They probably do to you too. But oh, yeah, I, get it up. I just laugh. I yeah, laugh I'm them. like, what? But is it because you were in that life you always had to respect? You know the damage you can do. It frustrates you because you think, fuck, you know nothing. Yeah. Because they are just assholes. They're just someone sitting in their underpants, eating a packet of Skittles, just hating on life. Wait, I wear a lot of glasses. So always, <laughs> guys always write, why do you wear glasses? What do you give a fuck? I wear glasses. <laughs> you stupid fuck. Another guy's talking about my hair. Another, I'm like, <laughs> I go, I'm not banging you. What do you yeah. get? What kind of hair I got? Yeah, I get you know, it. It's well. so yeah. crazy. I just shaved my hair and people yeah. are saying you had a hair transplant and I wear fake tan. And I'm thinking, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. Who cares? Even if I did, I don't. Yeah, 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 even yeah. if I did, who gives a fuck? Right. It's just, um, how's life now? John, obviously losing your daughter and I think one of your sons are in prison. How do you try and kick on and do the right in that's, life? That, that's why I got a son in prison. Same thing. When he shot, the, he shot a guy. It had nothing to do with him. He just happened to be sitting at a house where the guy had a problem with the guy that owned the building. He was out in front when another guy, guy said, right. anyway, the end up busy, ends up shooting the guy. The guy leaves two or three times. And when the guy leaves, my son goes upstairs, gets a gun. The guy shows up. My son shoots at him seven times. He hits him once. The guy ratted on Gangster. And I told my son, I says, how'd that work out for you? Why didn't you go in the fucking house and stay in the house in your apartment? He goes, did you do that? I go, did I ruin my life? I says, you should learn from me. I ruined my life. So now he's at the beach, the guy. The guy didn't die. He's at the beach. He's getting laid. He's going to eat dinner, and you're in jail like a moron. So who won? And and this is what I, I try to tell my other kids. I don't, I, don't, I don't want you guys. If I want you guys to be gangsters, we could have took over. Well, I got four sons. I just said a couple of cousins. I don't need nobody else. But that I know what that life is. Why would I do that to my kids? Because all I do is suffer. Now I'm suffering double that because he's there. You know, it's one thing us being there, but then when your kids are there, it's suffer more. And after my daughter, it's it's a pain that's never going to go away. Yeah. You know, anybody that loses a kid, it's day and night pain, day and night. And I want to explode. Don't get me wrong. Inside, I'm so frustrated because I can't change it. And you know, sometimes when people bother me, I'm like, I'm looking to take it out on somebody like when I was on the street. And they're too stupid to know, like stop bothering somebody. And you know, and certain people snap. And you know, I'm not, I'm under control, but today, but you never know. I can't tell you what I'll do two years from now, next year, next month. I just take it day to day that I'm a different person and I'm gonna keep it this way. And I, and therapy and religion and God, I really, it helps me. Yeah. And, you know, meditating a little bit. And, you know, I learned to, to control myself. Yeah, because if people say time's a healer, but that's bullshit. People who say that have never lost a loved one. You adapt to the pain. The pain's always fucking there. You, all, you, you live with it every day, but you seem to just adapt to it where you think, okay, I accept it today, but the pain's always there. The yeah, I ones. told somebody, you know, when you, you get a toothache and it hits the nerve because you let it go mm -hmm. and you had that pain that doesn't go away. Just put that in your heart, put it in your head, and you're never gonna stop that pain. It's just never gonna stop. And you know, anybody that, like I said, unfortunately lost a, a, a child out there, or you, your baby's always a child, doesn't matter how old she or he is when they pass. It's just so, it's unbelievable that it never changes. The, the, the agony in your heart and your head. Every time you look at a picture, every time you go get something to eat, you remember them. Every time you're walking down the street, after you wake up in the night to go to the bathroom, when you look at the, the pictures, it's just n never gonna go away. It's just never gonna get easier. It's never, it's just gonna be there. And unfortunately for a lot of people, they've been through this. So it's, uh, and you know, some idiot wrote and said something, well, that's karma from him. Mm. And I said, you fuck. this is the fucking dog's mutt, whatever word you want to use from coward that says something stupid, karma. My daughter didn't do anything. I did. You want karma? Then wish me dead. What, what the fuck has I got to do with an innocent girl? This is just weak pieces of shit that say shit like this. Why do you feel as if it affects you so much with the trolls? Because of your life? Because of my, you know, it, it because of my life, if I ever could gather them in the room, like I said, I wouldn't have no, see, here's the difference. I wouldn't have no qualms with just shooting each one, lining them up and killing them. Wouldn't be anything to me, and they know it. 
And that's why they do it because they say, well, well I know now he'll never do it again because I hear the way he talks. You know, he's got a different life. So now I could say what I want. This frustration. Either they don't have, their wife was cheating on them. Either they could never meet a woman. Either they're fucking broke or they could, they're cowards. Every time there was a problem, they ran away. Something. You don't act like this for no reason. You know, there's got to be some sort of underlining hate for themselves why they do it. It ain't about me, actually. It's about them, but it's still, overall, you know, listen, if you're in a good mood and you look at it, for the most part, you laugh. Once in a while, you're triggered because maybe you're not in a good mood or whatever from something else. What do you think now, John, if everybody's speaking out, gangsters, drug lords, shooters, how do you see it all? Everything's changed now. This is the kind of, but I, I seen the two-pack guy. He just got himself fucking charged for murder. So they're sitting Which on a podcast. Um, what's his name? He was sitting on a podcast talking about who was there when he shot Tupac and just got charged with the murder. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. People Tupac need to be, guy, yeah. listen, yeah. because you've, have you got immunity then? You can talk about oh, everything. I get, uh, but there's done. people who think because it's they, 25 they, years ago, they, please don't they, fucking forget. They, I don't know why they do it. You know, this became a business for me also. Somebody said something, oh, you know, he's making money from it. No shit. Yeah. And you know, I, I'm in this business. I do interviews, I do magazines, I do talk shows, I do movies. I, you know, this is my line of work. I'm not a gangster anymore. I got to make a living. So, you know, when they say dumb, they, they just, people just say some dumb shit that, uh, I don't know why they say it. And like I said, they got, it's something with their own personalities because I, the one thing I don't do is like, I, I watch your show obviously. And I said, you know, I enjoy your show and I don't, I'm not a hater. I'm like, good. He does good for himself. What, what's the problem? Why am I going to hate you? What am I going to dislike you? Why am I going to wish bad yeah. on you? Like, you know, so when people, I see someone driving a nice car. I don't hate the guy who's driving a nice car. I'm just wondering how he got it. Like, you know, what do you do for a living to get that car? I want to do what you're doing. You want to you wanna copy the guy so you can be successful like the guy. So, you know, if I watch a show, I try to take a little point. As I watch somebody else's, I try to take a you know, point this from that show. Yeah, success leaves so, clues. Yeah. yeah. So, what well, is your show and stuff, John, and social media is for people to come and contact us. We've got a big audience in the UK, and everybody will know your story anyway. Yeah. But I believe we've taken on a little different journey today and <clears throat> just try to understand you more, what you've done, what you fucking try to overcome. Well, the UK, I did a lot, you know, because I did your TV Guide cover, I did the GQ centerfold, mm -hmm. I did the Trevor McDonald, who's a great guy. And I got along great with Trevor and we stayed in touch for a while, me and him. And actually I got his picture up in the house with me. He's a, he's a, he's a that's a real gentleman. He's a legend. What a, the guy's a gentleman. So, you know, and I'm in the UK a lot. So I got a lot of friends there. They know a lot of the stuff I'm talking about because they were in prisons with me or hung out with me. And, you know, so listen, you know, hopefully people listen to it and they, you know, they understand, you know, where we're coming from for the good I'm talking about. You know? Yeah. What well, is all your YouTubes and social media stuff for people to come and uh, come on board and watch your own stuff? Yeah, mine, they, they could, my, it's on, you know, it's under my name, John, yeah. John Elite is my uh, podcast. If they just go under my name, my Instagram's the same. It's uh, blue checked. Uh, I think I got about a half a million on that. And Facebook, uh, I'm on that uh, also. I think I got, I got a lot of pages on Facebook. I think like 20 pages or something. So, uh, you know, I just uh, try to go get out there and do lectures. You know, I do a lot of lectures for schools and kids and stuff. And then, you know, so try I stay busy. And then a new the movie. Right I got a new movie coming out called Pony. Actually, po Pony's in development now, and it's about uh, dirt car racing and fentanyl. And the reason why uh, they asked me to take the lead part in it is because of the fentanyl, and they asked me if I would do it for awareness for my daughter. And so I said, a hundred percent. I mean, it's not easy to do because of that, but it gets into the fentanyl and uh, you know, how many people in the United States are dying a year. And and that numbers, they keep saying around a hundred thousand of from fentanyl deaths and opioids, but that number's doubled. People don't know this is, it, it's very hard to detect fentanyl in your blood after they pass away, unless you have an autopsy and they look for it. So that number's not 100, it's 200, and this government's not doing shit about it. They just talk a good game, but uh, they got that border wide open, and it's causing all kinds of death, terrorism, and uh, people getting killed on the way over, women are getting raped, kids are getting raped, they're getting child trafficking, they're sleeping on the street, this is not humanitarian. It's terrible what they're doing. 
So what is fentanyl for people who don't know? Because we don't have that in the UK. Fentanyl is like a, a grain of a salt can kill you. So the, what they're doing is they're putting it in cocaine. So if you, you're asking for cocaine, they're putting fentanyl. You snort it and it, and it knocks you out. And they use it actually in hospitals when we have an operation. It's very lethal. And there's no way these dummies can control it, but it's very addictive. So that's why they're putting it in. So they can keep people addicted to their drugs. And they make crazy money. For a, a kilo of fentanyl, you can make a million dollars off it. Because you put a little drop in, in they're putting it in marijuana, they're putting it in pills, they're putting it in diet pills, they're putting it in Adderall for college students. They're putting it in everything you can think of. And the people are dying left and right here. Listen, I sold drugs back in the day. I've done a lot of stupid shit, not, not to your level, but see when you sold drugs as well and other people are destroying their life through it, your own greed, my greed. Yeah, um, yeah. Is that when you then look at your life as well and think, fuck me, look at the shit that I've done. When you Is that... Change is hard, John, you know, that's yourself, you're still trying to change, you're still trying to do good, but see when you start questioning it all, when you start waking up to life and start understanding the mistakes that you've made and the, how deluded you were to be even thinking that was normal, Does it? how hard is it to then see all the shit that you've done and then... But well, I, I, sometimes I say, well, <clears throat> to see all I've done, maybe this had happened to me, so I can wake up to what you're saying, because I wasn't waking up to it before. I was, you know, going out and buying a, a Corvette convertible cash. I was, you know, back in those days, I was the car. You know, going buying a Mercedes cash, going to buy houses and properties. And I thought it was successful, but you left out the part of how I got there. You know, you bullshit yourself. But now you, when you change your life and you're doing the right thing, you start learning, like, maybe this was a purpose and needed to go through all this the suffering, all the years in solitary confinement, because I spent years in solitaries. And, the, you know, those conditions in Brazil. And and maybe that's what I needed to wake up to say that this life is all bullshit. Get into, do the right thing with your life. And, you know, and you wake up and you start realizing, hey, you owe the society and these young kids something. So when you start doing positive things, hopefully when they listen to this and, and all the shows like this, they say to themselves, oh, this ain't all glorified like I thought it was. You know, so they don't follow this. Go be a truck driver. And you can get rich. You don't got to go to college. I tell everybody, you know, get a, get a, a, a career as an a, a electrician, a carpenter, a plumber. You can get very wealthy off that. You can have a good life. You know, just get a trade, any kind of trade. You'd be a cameraman. Be the, I mean, there's a million jobs. You don't have to be a, a lawyer, a doctor. That's, you know, the old, you know, thinking, but thinking out of the box. You don't need to be rich either to be happy. So, How's life like today, John? I mean, I, I, I try to get through things. Life's, you know, it's a different type of struggle now because what we mentioned earlier, but uh, I try to stay positive. I try to be a motivational guy to people and, and say, listen, we all go through struggles. That's what uh, life's about is just up and downs and struggles and, and you got to get to the finish line doing the right thing, uh, not the wrong thing. So as things keep happening, you got to be smart and go in the right direction and hopefully... Uh, will make change by, by uh, leadership, not by, you know, by our actions. Just before we finish up, because I know you've went, you've kind of went back and forth now with Sam and the Bill. Where did that kind of beef start? Because he was talking nonsense about kids and uh, me helping kids, and he said, fuck them. And then I got into, you killed that 15-year-old kid, wasn't a gangster. And I'm like, you're a coward, man. I said, you don't even want to admit it. You sold drugs with your family. You won't admit it. You got a, you're a racist bastard because he knows I have a lot of black friends and Spanish friends. And we got into that. And he's got an AB, fake AB tattoo on him. So you can't even bullshit and say you're not. You, you got the tattoo on you. You're a fucking racist. Your daughter, I was friends with his daughter. His daughter's nice. I mean, I got along good with his daughter. She dated a black guy. She has an interracial, he has an interracial granddaughter. Pretty girl, nice girl. So now how you now that you got that dumb tattoo on your chest or on your arm, wherever you put it, I says, how do you relate that now? So th this is why everything about the guy, honestly, I haven't done, he's a phony. He's not a tough guy who wouldn't be hiding in Arizona. He'd be here just like I am. And you took and borrowed $3,000 off me. And I give you the 3000 you took it, and you won't pay it back. You're just a fucking low life. Just that's why I keep saying it. I says, I won't stop saying it. I really am never going to say it because it's the point. And I'll take the 3000 in front of you and throw it out the window. It's not the $3,000. i am just going to keep abusing him to show what kind of 
what this is the character of this guy. You know, imagine he won't even address it. Address the 3,000. Why won't you pay it? You said that you owed it. You said it on your own show. So why won't you pay it? I mean, he's just a fucking coward. You got a half a million in Brooklyn. You let Louie take it from you. And you didn't do nothing, but yet you're on these stupid shows telling everybody you're on the boss and you got records up that you killed Paul Castellano when you didn't kill Paul Castellano. You had nothing to do with it. You know, possibly you were five blocks away, possibly, if it's true. But I caught him in so many lies, I don't believe him. Why does he owe you 3000 He had no money. He has to borrow $3,000. And then he made some stupid story up. And, you know, he went on 40 minutes talking about me on a tape that's on my Patreon about, you know, I'm a tough guy, killer, blah, 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 you know, all that stuff. And now he's trying to retract saying he just did it because of the 3000 So you're that much of a clown to even say, you imagine if that's true, that you took 3000 just to say that. So, you know, again, either way, he's a, he makes a clown of himself. So, and uh, so I don't know how that's, that's never going to go away because I don't respect the guy. I just think he's a fucking big mouth. For anybody watching, John, that's maybe thinking about going down that life of crime, what advice would you have for them? We'll go look at the end up of everybody. The bosses, Joe Messina wearing a wire, Sammy Gravano hiding in Arizona. This is the life. You want that life? Then that's what you'll get. Nothing but suffering. Lose your family and uh, not have a good life. It's just not a good life. It's not, if it was a good life, I'd say it. Hey, I'd promote kids into the life. Why wouldn't I? Instead, I promote him into doing the right thing. John, would you like to finish up on anything else? No, just that, you know, on a positive note, I said it the other day, but there was a guy, Louis, that was in a restaurant, a Spanish guy, I believe he was Spanish, with his girlfriend, and I was on the other side of the, the restaurant. I got up and chased him outside the door to tell him that, you know, everybody always wants to talk negative about people, but he got up to help this old white guy that was in a wheelchair, and uh, the, she was with a wife and another old, that they couldn't get him in. He get, he jumped up and helped him. So instead of people always talking negative, there's something positive, you know. There's there's some good people out there still. And a uh, very humble guy. And I, I said that I would talk about him, and I meant it. I said, because it just kind of, I shook my head. I said, finally, there's some, you know, you see some nice people that are really just genuinely good guys. there would be anybody you'd like to sit across from and do an interview with? Or any victims' families as well? Or other I've talked gangsters? to victims' families. Uh, I did do that. I spoke to victims' families when I first came home, met with them, sat in the house with them. How talked. was that? Uh, emotional. You know, you cry, you talk. You know, you know, they lost loved ones because of me. And, uh, you know, we talked it out. And they were gangster families too. So they understood the life. But we didn't understand why the fuck we lived that crazy life. And you know, you, it gets emotional, obviously, because you're you're destroying their family. And uh, so you went and met the I met them. Met there. the families of the people you had killed. Yeah, and some of them were also killers. So uh, it wasn't like you know you know, you know it's a dangerous situation because I didn't go with nobody by myself too. Uh, you know, you never know what's on somebody's mind, but uh, it was it was rough to do it, but I had to do it. I needed to talk to them. Why? What you said, living with myself, conscience, uh, trying to get forgiveness for myself and for them, for our lives, uh, and also um, try to talk about, talking to other kids about not following the pain that we caused each other and other people. Not easy to do. Did you rate John Gotti as a boss? I mean, no one's perfect. I mean, as a, as a, you know, I looked up to him. So as a boss in the street, he had some really good qualities of, uh, he knew how to maneuver people. As a street guy, he could have been a CEO. I told people this because he just knew how to maneuver people. He had a charisma about him. And uh, he was, you know, good to hang out with, drink with, and he was good to me. I mean, me, he treated me more like, you know, it doesn't matter what other people say, I don't care, but... I was in his house, I slept in his house, I was with him all the time, I was in all the weddings, I was around constantly, holidays, I mean, I guess you've seen it all, picking him up from court and coming out of his house, and, you know, so he, he trusted me, he liked me, he looked up to me, he looked at me, I looked up to him, excuse me, because I had the similar background to him. He grew up on Jamaica Avenue where I grew up. He went to the same high school where I went. He had a rough life, I did. so. 
uh, he lived in Cherry Hill where I lived later on in Jersey when he was in trouble. So we had a lot of things in common. And uh, he, listen, nobody's perfect, like I said. It's just yeah. It's a shitty life. So there is going to be no good rating for anybody in that life. Did you ever go to work with somebody who shit themselves and didn't want to do it? Yeah, and yeah. you were surprised? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was a guy, Frankie, that was out in Long Island. He ran out of the place when I was in the middle of uh, of doing something. So, you know, there's a lot of, listen, at the time I was steaming, I wanted to kill him. There was another guy that ran out of another situation with me, Vinny, uh, in the middle of a, a drug deal with counterfeit money. I wanted to kill him. Um, you know, guys are trying to be involved and be part of something and faking their way through, and they're not about it, and that's fine. And now I look back and say, well, they were smarter ones <laughs> not doing it. Yeah. So, you know. Just before we finish up, John, like I says, for coming on today and giving me your time telling your story, listen, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I believe you're a good guy. I believe what you're trying to do is amazing and you deserve, like, you're always going to get our soul speaking um, and talking shit, but that is what it is. John, would you like to finish up on anything else? No, just uh, anybody that suffered a loss of a, of a child, God bless them. Follow Black posted a project with Dee Gillen. It's a great project she does with families that lost family members from fentanyl and opioids. So, John, listen. Thank you. God bless you, mate. Bless you all God, the best. God bless you. Thank you. And take care. Appreciate it.